Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning to you wherever you are in the world, and welcome to the show Must Go Online, bringing you live performed readings of Shakespeare's complete works with a global cast every Wednesday. I'm Robert Miles, actor, writer, director, and creator of the Shakespeare Deck. Tonight's The Life and Death of King John will start in approximately 15 minutes' time. The first half will run for roughly 80 minutes, with a five-minute interval followed by a 70-minute second half. We've got a fantastic show for you tonight, a rare performed piece with some powerful and indeed pertinent language. Content warnings for the show include violence, death and grief. Tonight is our 13th show, Lucky 13, which means we've been creating brand new Shakespeare productions every week for more than three months now. If you continue to enjoy the work we're doing, please do consider donating to our Patreon page, an opt-in hardship fund for all those who take part. You can donate as little as £1.20 per month, but of course, if you're in a position to give more, it will be hugely appreciated. Please share your reactions using the hashtag showmustgoonline and follow at TSMG Online Live on Twitter and at showmustgoonline on Insta and Facebook. If you enjoy the show, please like the video and subscribe to this channel, remembering to hit the bell icon, set reminders to receive all notifications. Tonight's game is Twister. Spot the times the course of events veers wildly in unexpected directions. And now to introduce the play brought to us as always by the venerable Ben Crystal, it's my pleasure to welcome Gemma Miller. Gemma Miller is a lecturer in Shakespeare and early modern drama at Central School of Speech and Drama, Shakespeare's Globe and Ithaca College. She completed her PhD at King's College London and her first book, Childhood in Contemporary Performance of Shakespeare, was published in April this year. Gemma, the play is The Life and Death of King John and the floor is yours. Thank you, Rob, for the introduction. And thank you also to Ben for inviting me to talk about one of my favorite Shakespeare's plays, which is King John. So the first thing to say about this play is that without the first folio, which was published seven years after Shakespeare's death in 1623, we wouldn't have this play. There was no single edition version of this play published during Shakespeare's lifetime. So without the wonderful work of Hemings and Condell, we wouldn't have uh, Shakespeare's King John. What we do have, just to give you a little bit of context, is uh, an earlier play about King John dating to about 1589, um, which is attributed to George Peel, which we believe Shakespeare used as a source for his play. And then also what we have in 1598, a book published by Francis Mears, which lists a number of Shakespeare's plays, one of which is King John. So from that, we can deduce that King John was, was familiar to audiences in about, by about 1598. So scholars date this play to around 1596. Um, so where are we with this play? Well, it begins in the early 1200s. Richard the Lionheart is dead and John is on the throne. But John has a problem. He has a young nephew called Arthur who actually has a greater claim to the throne through patrilineal succession. And Arthur's mother is really fighting for Arthur to take the crown. And the biggest problem John faces at this point is that the French are also supporting Arthur's claim to the throne. And they're saying that if, uh, if John doesn't give up the, the throne to Arthur, that they will de declare war upon England. So there we have the dramatic conflict set up very early on in the play. So the play is really about interrogating ideas about legitimacy, succession, what it means to be English, and particularly what it means to be English within a larger European context. Now the, the play King John has a rather patchy performance history and I'm sure there are many of you out there who haven't actually seen a, a performance of the play. It was really popular in the 18th and 19th centuries where it appealed to audiences sense of melodrama and their love of stage spectacle. And in fact, the first known silent film of Shakespeare's plays was a four minute film of scenes extracted from King John. And that was, um, performed by the impossibly named Herbert Beerbone Tree. Uh, it's well worth a look, it's on YouTube and it features a very, very long protracted um, death scene. But the play really fell out of favour in the 20th century, uh, although it's enjoyed a bit of a revival in the last kind of 20 years. And there are a few reasons for this, I think. So as a history play, it really kind of defies conventions of history plays. It doesn't fall within the cycle of history plays that directors have loved staging. The, the eight plays that make up um, the, the lead up to the Tudor dynasty. So starting with Richard II, the two Henry IVs, Henry V, 
three Henry the Sixth, and an ending with Richard the Third. So it's sort of it's an outline in terms of history plays. Although Shakespeare did write it in the middle of writing those um, other eight plays, um, it's also set a lot earlier. Um, and in terms of history play conventions, it doesn't feature a big climactic battlefield, a battle scene like the um, Bosworth Field in Richard the Third or Agincourt in Henry the Fifth. Um, it, as a hero, um, John is sort of quite underwhelming. It's not the largest character in terms of line length, um, and he doesn't have the, the best verse in this play. And there is some beautiful and witty and incredibly lyrical verse in this play. Um, and it's one of only two Shakespeare plays, actually, that's written completely in verse, the other one's Witch the uh, Second. And it really is, uh, it really is beautifully written, in particularly um, lyrical in parts. Um, so what do I love about this play? Well, what the things I love about it are actually the things that make it stand out from the other history plays. So I said uh, John is quite underwhelming as a character, but it's really an ensemble play. Uh, and characters that are often marginalized from history plays and actually marginalized from history generally really come to the fore in this play. So there are three extremely strong matriarchal figures who really dominate the first half of the play, um, in particular Constance, the mother of young Arthur, and Queen Eleanor, the mother of John. They stage the most fantastic stand-up slanging match um, that the men just cannot contain, so they really kind of transgress conventions of patriarchy and conventions of history plays. And Constance as a character has the most beautiful speeches. She has uh, a fantastic monologue where she thinks her son Arthur has died. It's a real kind of outpouring of grief. Uh, grief fills the room up of my absent child, it starts. And incidentally, King John was written in 1596, which is the same year that um, Shakespeare's young son Hamlet died. So over the centuries, writers have tried to kind of link that speech to the, the playwright's own feelings of grief at losing a child. It, it's, it's that kind of heart-wrenching as a speech. Um, I said the play was particularly popular in the 18th century. A great actress, Sarah Siddons, made the part of Constance in uh, her own during the 18th century, to the point that, according to legend, um, audience members would leave the show after Constance uh, disappears in sort of midpoint of the play because they felt that they the, the play could never recreate the kind of epic emotional heights that Sarah Siddons had achieved in the first half. Um, and the other character I really just want to talk about is young Arthur. So this is the second largest child character in the whole Shakespeare canon in terms of line length and he has the longest speaking single scene. Uh, so it's a really challenging role for a young um, for a young actor. And um, Shakespeare does something really interesting with this character. So the historical Arthur was 16 when he died. The Arthur in the earlier play, The Troublesome Reign, was 14, but Shakespeare makes him really very, very young and therefore kind of an icon of vulnerability and victimhood and pathos. And Arthur really is the emotional center of the play. And this great long scene with Hubert in act four is the fulcrum. It's, the, it's definitely the point at which John uh, really loses support. Of within the play and the world of the play, but also in a larger context from, from the audience as well. And these strong female characters and this very, very strong um, boy character make me think that in the mid 1590s, there must have been some incredibly talented young boy players in Shakespeare's company, because as we know, um, the female parts were also played by boys. Okay, so just to finish off, I'm going to talk about very briefly why I think King John is particularly relevant to the society, the world we're living in today. So it's a play about nationhood. It's about what it means to be English and what it means to be English in a wider European context. Um, it features a king who has terrible approval ratings at home and is in constant conflict with his European counterparts. Sound familiar? Uh, it's, it features characters who are struggling between family obligations and uh, obligations to the state. It interrogates religious institutions through the character of Pandolf, the Pope's legate. And then finally, what I think makes this play so fascinating is that it interrogates ideas of truth and, and fact and really shows them to be malleable and subjective uh, and open to interpretation and open to negotiation. And that's one of the reasons I think this play is so fantastic. And just finally, finally, 
the Royal Shakespeare Company staged a, a wonderful production of this at the end of 2019 into the beginning of 2020, directed by Eleanor Road, um, which brought all these contemporary relevances to the fore and I think opened up this play to a whole new audience. And I really hope that tonight you open it up to an even wider audience. So cast and crew have a wonderful show and everybody at home enjoy the performance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Gemma. That was an incredible introduction, that defiance of convention, the dramatic adaptation of the historical Arthur, and those five thoughts that you shared at the end, especially, I hope will really resonate with our audience tonight. And now, for one and for all, the show is about to begin. So please remember to capture your reactions on social using the hashtag showmustgoonline and prepare for charisma, capriciousness, conflict and commodity in the life and death of King John. Act 1, Scene 1, A Room in King John's Palace. Enter King John, Queen Eleanor, Pembroke, Essex and Salisbury with Chatillon of France. Now say, Chatillon, what would France with us? Thus, after greeting, speaks the King of France in my behaviour to the Majesty, the borrowed Majesty of England here. A strange beginning, borrowed majesty. Silence, mother, hear the embassy. Philip of France, in right and true behalf of thy deceased brother Geoffrey's son, Arthur Plantagenet, lays most lawful claim to this fair island and the territories to Ireland, Poitiers, Anjou, Touraine, Maine, desiring thee to lay aside the sword which sways usurpingly these several titles and put the same into young Arthur's hand, thy nephew and right royal sovereign. And what follows if we disallow of this? The proud control of fierce and bloody war to enforce these rights so forcibly withheld. Here have we have war for war and blood for blood. Controlment for controlment. So answer France. Then take my king's defiance from my mouth, the farthest limit of my embassy. Bear mine to him, so depart in peace. Be thou as lightning in the eyes of France, for ere thou canst report, I will be there. The thunder of my cannon shall be heard. So hence, be thou the trumpet of our wrath and sullen presage of your own decay. An honourable conduct let him have. Pembroke, look to it. Farewell, chat, Eon. What now, my son? Have I not ever said how that ambitious Constance would not cease till she had kindled France and all the world upon the right and party of her son? This might have been prevented and made whole with very easy arguments of love, which now the manage of two kingdoms must with fearful bloody issue arbitrate. Our strong possession and our right for us. Your strong possession, much more than your right, or else it must go wrong with you and me. So much my conscience whispers in your ear, which none but heaven and you and I shall hear. My liege, mm -hmm. here is the strangest controversy come from the country to be judged by you that e'er I heard. Shall I produce the men? Let them approach. Our abbeys and our priories shall pay this expedition's charge. <laughs> what men are you? Your faithful subject, I, a gentleman, born in Northamptonshire, an eldest son, as I suppose, to Robert Falconbridge, a soldier by the honour-giving hand of Cœur de Leon knighted in the field. What art thou? The son and heir to that same Falconbridge. Is that the elder, and art thou the heir? We came not of one mother then, it seems. 
Most certain of one mother, mighty king, that is well known. And I, as I think, one father, but for the certain knowledge of that truth, I put you o'er to heaven and to my mother. Of that I doubt, as all men's children may. Out on thee, rude man. Thou dost shame thy mother and wound her honour with this diffidence. I, madam, no. I have no reason for it. That is my brother's plea and none of mine. The which, if he can prove, he pops me out at least from fair 500 pound a year. Heaven, guard my mother's honour and my land. A good blunt fellow. Why, being younger born, doth he lay claim to thine inheritance? I know not why except to get the land. But once he slandered me with bastardy, but whate'er I be is true begot or no, that still I lay upon my mother's head, but that I am as well begot my liege. Fair fall the bones that took the pains from me. Compare our faces and be judge yourself. If old Sir Robert did beget us both and were our father and this son like him, whoo old Sir Robert, father, on my knee, I give heaven thanks, I was not like to thee. Why, what a madcap hath heaven lent us here. He hath a trick of Cœur de Leon's face. The accent of his tongue affecteth him. Do you not read some tokens of my son in the large composition of this man? Mine eye hath well examined his parts and finds them perfect. Richard. Sirrah, speak. What doth move you to claim your brother's land? Because he hath half a face like my father. With half that face he would have all my land. A half-faced groat and five hundred pound a year. My gracious liege, when that my father lived, your brother did employ my father much. Well, sir, by this you cannot get my land. Your tale must be how he employed my mother. And once dispatched him in an embassy to Germany, there with the emperor, to treat of high affairs touching that time. The advantage of his absence took the king, and in the meantime sojourned at my father's, where how he did prevail, I shame to speak, but truth is truth. Large lengths of seas and shores between my father and my mother lay, as I have heard my father speak himself when this same lusty gentleman was got. Upon his deathbed, he by will bequeathed his lands to me and took it on his death that this, my mother's son, was none of his. And if he were, he came into the world full fourteen weeks before the course of time. Then, good my leash, let me have what is mine, my father's land as was my father's will. Sarah, your brother is legitimate. Your father's wife did after wedlock bear him, and if she did play false, the fault was hers, which fault lies on the hazards of all husbands that marry wives. Tell me, how if my brother, who, as you say, took pains to get this son, had of your father claimed this son for his? In sooth, good friend, your father might have kept this calf, bred from his cow from all the world. In sooth he might. Then, if he were my brother's, my brother might not claim him, nor your father, being none of his, refuse him. This concludes, my mother's son did get your father's heir. Your father's heir must have your father's land. Shall then my father's will be of no force to dispossess that child which is not his? Of no more force to dispossess me, sir, than was his will to get me, as I think. Whether hadst thou rather be a Falconbridge, and, like thy brother, to enjoy thy land, or the reputed son of Cœur de Lyon, lord of thy presence, and no land beside? Madam, if I had my brother's shape, and I had his, Sir Robert's his, like him, if, and if my legs were two such riding rods, my arms such eel skins stuffed, my face so thin, and to his shape were heir to all this land, would I might never stir from off this place, I would give it every foot to have this face. It would not be, so no, in any case. <coughs> I like thee well. Wilt thou forsake thy fortune, bequeath thy land to him, and follow me? I am a soldier and now bound to France. 
Brother, take you my land, I'll take my chance. Your face hath got 500 pound a year, yet sell your face for five pence and tis dear. Madam, I'll follow you on to the death. Nay, I would have you go before me thither. Uh, our country manners give our betters way. What is thy name? Philip, my liege, so is my name begun. Philip, good old Sir Robert's wife's eldest son. From henceforth bear his name, whose form thou bearest. Hmm. Kneel thou down, Philip. But rise, more great. Arise, Sir Richard and Plantagenet. Brother by the mother's side, give me a hand. My father got me, gave me honour, yours gave me land. Now blessed be the hour by day, night or day when I was got, Sir Robert was away. <laughs> the very spirit of Plantagenet. I am thy grandam, Richard. Call me so. Madam, by chance, but not by truth. Do what though? Near or far off, well one is still well shot, and I am I, however I was begot. Go, Falconbridge. Now hast thou thou desire? A landless knight makes thee a landed squire. Come, madam, come, Richard. We must speed for France, for France, for it is more than need. Brother, adieu. May good fortune come to thee, for thou was got in the way of honesty. <laughs> oh, well, a foot of honour, better than I was, but many a many foot of land the worse. Well. Now I can make any Joan a lady. Ah, oh, good day, Sir Richard, God a mercy fellow. And if his name be George, I'll call him Peter. For new made honour doth forget men's names. Uh, it is too respected and too sociable for your conversion. Now, your traveller, he and his toothpick at my worship's mess. And when my nightly stomach is sufficed, why then I suck my teeth and catechise my picked man of countries. My dear sir, thus leaning on my elbow, I begin. I shall beseech you. That is question now. And then comes answer like an absy book. Oh, sir, says answer, at your best command, at your employment, at your service, sir. No, sir, says question. I sweet, sir, at yours. And so, Air answer knows what question would, and saving in dialogue of compliments and talking of the Alps, the Apennines, the Pyrenean, and the River Po, it draws towards supper in conclusion so. But this is worshipful society, and fits the mounting spirit like myself, for he is but a bastard to the time that doth not smack of observation. And so am I, whether I smack or no. And not alone in habit and device, exterior form, outward accoutrement, but for the inward motion to deliver sweet, sweet, sweet poison for the age's tooth, which, though I will not practice to deceive, yet to avoid deceit, I mean to learn, for it shall strew the footsteps of my rising. Uh, but who comes in such haste in riding robes? Yeah, what woman post is this? Has she no husband that will take pains to blow a horn before her? Oh, me, it's my mother. Uh, how now, good lady, what brings you here to court so hastily? Where is that slave, thy brother? Where is he that holds in chase mine honour up and down? My brother Robert. The old Sir Robert's son. Your cold brand the giant, that same mighty man. Is it Sir Robert's son that you seek so? Sir Robert's son? I, thou unreverend boy. Sir Robert's son. Why scornst thou at Sir Robert? He is Sir Robert's son. And so are you. James Gunn, wilt thou give us leave a while? Good leave, good Philip. Philip, Sparrow. James, there's toys abroad, 
Anon, I'll tell thee more. Now, madam, I was not old Sir Robert's son. We know his handiwork, therefore, good mother, to whom I am beholding for these limbs. Sir Robert never hoped to make it this leg. So conspired with thy brother too, for thine own gain? Shouldst defend mine honor? What means this scorn, thou must untoward knave? Knight, to knight, good mother, basilisco-like, what? I am dubbed, I have it on my shoulder. But mother, I am not Sir Robert's son. I have disclaimed Sir Robert and my land legitimation name, and all is gone, then good. My mother, let me know my father, some proper man, I hope. Who was it, mother? Hast thou denied thyself a falcon bridge? As faithfully as I deny the devil. King Richard, Coeur de Lyon, was thy father. <laughs> By long and vehement suit, I was seduced to make room for him and my husband's bed. Heaven, lay not my transgression to my charge that art the issue of my dear offense, which was so strongly urged past my defense. Now, by this light, were I to get again, madam, I would not wish a better father. If some sins do bear their privilege on earth, and so doth yours, your fault was not your folly. Needs must you lay your heart at his dispose, subjected tribute to commanding love, against whose fury and unmatched force the aweless lion could not wage the fight, nor keep his princely heart from Richard's hand. He that perforce robs lions of their hearts may easily win a woman's. I, my mother, with all my heart, I thank thee for my father who lives and dares but say, thou didst not well when I was got, I'll send his soul to hell. Now come, lady, I will show thee to my kin, and then shall say, when Richard me begot, if thou had said him nay, it had been a sin. Who says it was? He lies. I say, twas not. Exeunt. Act 2, Scene 1, France, before the town of Angiers. Enter before Angiers, Philip, King of France, Louis, the Dauphin, Constance, Arthur, with forces at one door, at the other door, Austria, with forces. Before Angiers, well met, brave Austria. Arthur, that great forerunner of thy blood, Richard, that robbed the lion of his heart and fought the holy wars in Palestine by this brave duke came early to his grave and for amends to his posterity at our importance, hither is he come to spread his colors, boy, in thy behalf and to rebuke the usurpation of thy unnatural uncle, English John. Embrace him, love him, give him welcome hither. God shall forgive you Coeur de Leon's death the rather that you give his offspring life, shadowing their right under your wings of war. I give you welcome with a powerless hand, but with a heart full of unstained love. Welcome before the gates of Angiers, Duke. A noble boy, who would not do thee right? Upon thy cheek lay I this zealous kiss. A seal to this indenture of my love, that to my home I will no more return till Angiers and the right thou hast in France together with that pale, that white-faced shore, whose foot spurns back to the ocean's roaring tides and coops from other lands her islanders, even till that England hedged in with the main, salute thee for her king, till then, fair boy, will I not think of home, but follow arms. Oh, take his mother's thanks, a widow's thanks, till your strong hand shall help to give him strength to make a more requital of your love. The peace of heaven is theirs that lift their swords in such a just and charitable war. Well then, to work. 
Our cannon shall be bent against the brows of this resisting town. Call for our chiefest men of discipline to cull the plots of best advantages. We'll lay before this town our royal bones, weighed to the marketplace in Frenchman's blood, but we will make it subject to this boy. Stay for an answer to your embassy, lest unadvised you stain your swords with blood. My Lord Chatillon may from England bring that right in peace, which here we urge in war, and then we shall repent each drop of blood that hot, rash haste so indirectly shed. A wonder, lady. Lo, upon thy wish, our messenger, Chatillon, is arrived. What England says, say briefly, gentle lord, we coldly pause for thee, Chatillon, speak. And turn your forces from this paltry seat and stir them up against a mightier task. England, impatient of your just demands, hath put himself in arms. The adverse winds, which leisure I have stayed, had given him time to land his legions all as soon as I. His marches are expedient to this town, his forces strong, his soldiers confident. With him along is come the mother queen, an Arte, stirring him to blood and strife. With her, her niece, the Lady Blanche of Spain. With them, a bastard of the king's deceased, and all the unsettled humours of the land, rash, inconsiderate, fiery voluntaries, with ladies' faces and fierce dragon spleens, have sold their fortunes at their native homes, bearing their birthrights proudly on their backs to make a hazard of new fortunes here. In brief, a braver choice of dauntless spirits than now the English bottoms have wafted o'er did never float upon the swelling tide to do offence and scathe in Christendom. The interruption of their churlish drums cuts off more circumstance. They are at hand to parley or to fight, therefore prepare. How much unlooked for is this expedition? By how much unexpected, by so much, we must awake endeavor for defense, for courage mounteth with occasion. Let them be welcome, then we are prepared. Peace be to France. Peace be to France, if France in peace permit our just and lineal entrance to our own. If not, bleed France, and France ascend to heaven, whilst we, God's wrathful agent, do correct their proud contempt that beats his peace to heaven. Peace be to England, if that war return from France to England there to live in peace. England we love, and for that England's sake with burden of our armor, here we sweat. This toil of ours should be a work of thine, but thou from loving England art so far that thou hast underwrought his lawful king, cut off the sequence of posterity, outfaced infant state, and done a rape upon the maiden virtue of the crown. Look here upon thy brother Geoffrey's face. These eyes, these brows were molded out of his, his little abstract doth contain that large which died in Geoffrey, and the hand of time shall draw his brief into his huge volume. That Geoffrey was thy elder brother born, and this his son, England, was Geoffrey's right, and this is Geoffrey's in the name of God. How comes it then that thou art called a king, when living blood doth in these temples beat, which owe the crown that thou or masterest? From whom hast thou this great commission, France, to draw my answer from thy articles? From that supernal judge that stirs good thoughts in any breast of strong authority to look into the blots and stains of right. That judge hath made me guardian to this boy, under whose warrant I impeach thy wrongs, and by whose help I mean to chastise it. Alack, thou dost usurp authority. Excuse, it is to beat usurping down. Who is it thou dost call usurper, France? Let me make answer, thy usurping son. Out, insolent. Thy bastard shall be king, that thou mayst be a queen and check the world. My bed was ever to thy son as true as thine was to thy husband, and this boy liker in feature to his father, Geoffrey, than thou and John in manners being as like as rain to water, or devil to his dam. My boy, a bastard? By my soul, I think his father never was so true begot. It cannot be, and if thou wert his mother. 
Oh, there's a good mother boy that blots thy father. Oh, there's a good granddam boy that would blot thee. Peace. Hear the crier. What the devil art thou? The one that will play the devil, sir, with you, and he may catch your hide and you alone. You are the hare of whom this proverb goes, whose valour plucks dead lions by the beard. I'll smoke your skin coat and catch you right. Sirrah, look to it, faith. I will, if faith. Oh, well did he become that lion's robe, that did disrobe the lion of that robe. It lies as slightly on the back of him as great Hercules shows upon an ass. But ass. I'll take that burden from your back, or lay on that shall make your shoulders crack. What cracker is this saying that deaths our ears with this abundance of superfluous breath? King Philip, determine what we shall do straight. Women and fools, break off your conference. King John, this is the very sum of all. England and Ireland, Anjou, Touraine, Maine, in right of Arthur do I claim of thee. Wilt thou resign them and lay down thy arms? My life as soon. I do defy thee, France. Arthur of Bretagne, yield thee to my hand, and out of my dear love, I'll give thee more than e'er the coward hand of France can win. Submit thee, boy. Come to thy grandam, child. Do it, child. Go to it, grandam, child. Give grandam kingdom, and it grandam will give it a, a plum, a cherry, and a fig. Oh, there's a good grandam. Put my mother peace. I would I were low laid in my grave. I'm not worth this coil that's made for me. Oh, his mother shames him so, poor boy. He weeps. Now shame upon you, where she does or no, his granddam's wrongs and not his mother's shames draws those heaven moving pearls from those poor eyes, which heaven shall take in nature of a fee. I, with these crystal beads, heaven shall be bribed to do him justice and revenge on you. Thou monstrous slanderer of heaven and earth. Thou monstrous injurer of heaven and earth, call not me slanderer. Thou and thine usurp the dominations, royalties, and rights of this oppressed boy. This is thy eldest son's son, infortunate in nothing but in thee. Thy sins are visited in this poor child. The canon of the law is laid on him, being but the second generation removed from thy sin-conceiving womb. Bedlam have done. Thou honoured visored scold, I can produce a will that bars the title of thy son. Aye, who doubts that? A will, a wicked will, a woman's will, a canker grandam's will. Peace, lady, pause, or be more temperate. It ill beseems this presence to cry aim to these ill-tuned repetitions. Some trumpets summon hither to the walls these men of Angers. Let us hear them speak whose title they admit, Arthur's or John's. Who is it that wolf hath warned us to the walls? Tis France, for England. England for itself. You men of Angers and my loving subjects. You loving men of Angers, Arthur's subjects. Our trumpet called you to this gentle parl. For our advantage. Therefore, hear us first. These flags of France that are advanced here before the eye and prospect of your town have hither marched to your endangerment. The cannons have their bowels full of wrath and ready mounted are they to spit forth with their iron indignation against your walls. All preparation for a bloody siege and merciless proceeding by these French confronts your city's eyes, your winking gates, and but for our approach, these sleeping stones that as a waste doth girdle you about by the compulsion of their ordinance by this time from their fixed beds of lime had been disinhabited and wide havoc made for bloody power to rush upon your peace. But on the sight of us, your lawful king, 
who painfully with much expedient march have bought a countercheck before your gates to save unscratched your city's threatened cheeks. Behold, the French amazed vouchsafe a pearl. And now, instead of bullets wrapped in fire to make a shaking fever in your walls, they shout but calm words folded up in smoke to make a faithless error in your ears, which trust accordingly, kind citizens, and let us in. Your king, whose labored spirits, forwearied in his action of swift speed, craves harborage within your city's walls. When I have said, make answer to us both. Lo, in this right hand, whose protection is most divinely vowed upon the right of him it holds, stands young Plantagenet, son to the elder brother of this man, and king or him and all that he enjoys. For this downtrodden equity, we tread in warlike march these greens before your town, being no further enemy to you than the constraint of hospitable zeal in the relief of this oppressed child religiously provokes. Be pleased then, to pay that duty which you truly owe to him that owes it, namely this young prince. And then our arms, like to a muzzled bear, if save in respect, hath all offense sealed up, our cannon's malice vainly shall be spent against the invulnerable clouds of heaven, and with a blessed and unvexed retire, with unhacked swords and helmets all unbruised, we bear home that lusty blood again, which here we came to spout against your town, and leave your children wives and you in peace. But if you fondly pass our proffered offer, tis not the roundier of your old faced walls can hide you from our messengers of war, though all these English and their discipline were harbored in their rude circumference. Then tell us, shall your city call us lords in that behalf which we have challenged it? Or shall we give the signal to our rage and stop in blood to our possession? In brief, we are the King of England subjects. For him and in his right, we hold this town. Acknowledge then the King and let me in. That can we not, but he that proves the King. To him will we prove loyal. Till that time we have rammed up our gates against the world. Doth not the crown of England prove the King? And if not that, I bring you witnesses. Twice, 15,000 hearts of England's breed. Bastards and elks. To verify our title with their lives. As many and as well-born bloods as those. Some bastards too. Stand in his face to contradict his claim. Till you compound whose right is worthiest, we, for the worthiest, hold the right from both. God forgive the sin of all those souls that to their everlasting residence before the dew of evening fall shall fleet in dreadful trial of our kingdom's king. Amen, amen. Mount Chevalier, to arms. St. George that swings the dragon and air since sits on horse's back at mine hostess's door. Teach us some fence. Sirrah, were I at home at your den, Sirrah, with your lioness, I would set an ox head on your lion's hide and make a monster of you. Peace no more. Oh, tremble, for you hear the lion roar. Up higher to the plain, where we'll set forth in best appointment all our regiments. Speed then to take advantage of the field. It shall be so, and at the other hill command the rest to stand. God and our right. <laughs>
You men of Angier, open wide your gates and let young Arthur, Duke of Bretagne, in, who by the hand of France this day hath made much work for tears in many an English mother whose sons lie scattered on the bleeding ground. Many a widow's husband groveling lies. On the cold earth groveling the discolored ground. And victory with little loss doth lay upon the dancing banners of the French who are at hand triumphantly displayed to enter conquerors and to proclaim Arthur, Duke of Bretagne, England's king and yours. Rejoice, you men of Angers, ring your bells, King John. Your king and England's doth approach, commander of this hot, malicious day. Their armors that marched hence so silver bright, hither return all guilt with Frenchmen's blood. There stuck no plume in any English crest that is removed by a staff of France. Our colors do return in those same hands that did display them when we first marched forth. And like a jolly troop of huntsmen come, our lusty English, all with purpled hands, died in the dying slaughter of their foes. Open your gates and give the victors way. Herald, from off our towers we might behold, from first to last, the onset and retire of both your armies, whose equality by our best eyes cannot be censured. Blood hath bought blood, and blows have answered blows. Strength matched with strength, and power confronted power. Both alike, and both alike we like. One must prove greatest, while they weigh so even. We hold our town for neither, yet for both. France. <laughs> Hast thou yet more blood to cast away? <sighs> Say, shall the current of our right roam on, whose passage, vexed with thy impediment, shall leave his native channel and o'er swell with course disturbed even thy confining shores? Unless thou let his silver water keep a peaceful progress to the ocean. England. Thou hast not saved one drop of blood in this hot trial more than we of France, rather lost more. And by this hand I swear that sways the earth this climate overlooks. Before we will lay down our just-born arms, we'll put thee down against whom these arms we bear, or add a royal number to the dead, gracing the scrolls that tells of this war's loss with slaughter coupled to the name of kings. Ha <laughs> ha! Majesty! How high thy glory towers when the rich blood of kings is set on fire! Oh, now doth death line his dead chaps with steel. The swords of soldiers are his teeth, his fangs, and are now he feasts musing the flesh of men in undetermined differences of kings. Why stand these royal fronts amazed thus? Cry havoc, kings, back to the stained field. You equal potent, fiery, kindled spirits, then let confusion of one part confirm the other's peace, till then blows, blood and death. Whose party do the townsmen yet admit? Speak, citizen, for England. Who's your king? The king of England, when we know the king. Know him in us, but here hold up his right. In us, that are our own great deputy, and bear possession of our person here, lord of our presence, Angers, and of you. A greater power than we denies all this. Until it be undoubted, we do lock our formal scruple in our strong bag gates. 
kings of our fear until our fears resolved be by some certain king purged and disposed. By heaven, these scroils of Angers flout you kings and stand securely on their battlements as in a theatre. Whence they gape and point at your industrious scenes and acts of death, your royal presences be ruled by me. Now be friends a while, and both conjointly bend your sharpest deeds of malice on this town. By east and west, let France and England mount their battering cannon charged to the mouths, till the soul fearing clamours have brawled down the flinty ribs of this contemptuous city. I play incessantly upon these jades, even till unfenced desolation leave them as naked as the vulgar air. That done, dissever your united strengths and part your mingled colours once again, then turn face to face and bloody point to point. Then in a moment, fortune shall cull forth out of one side her happy minion, to whom in favour she shall give the day and kiss him with glorious victory. How like you, this wild council mighty states, smacks it not something of the policy? Now by the sky that hangs above our heads, I like it well. France? Shall we knit our powers and lay this Angers even with the ground? And then after fight, who shall be king of it? And if thou hast the metal of a king, being wronged as we are by this peevish town, turn thou the mouth of thy artillery, as we will ours against these saucy walls. And when we have dashed them to the ground, why then defy each other? And pell-mell make work upon ourselves from heaven or to hell. Let it be so. Say, where were you assault? We from the West will send destruction into this city's bosom. I from the North. Our thunder from the South shall rain their drift of bullets on this town. <laughs> Prudent discipline from North to South. Austria and France shoot in each other's mouth. And I'll stir them to it. Come, away, away. And hear us, great kings, vouchsafe a while to stay, and I shall show you peace and fair face the league. Win you this city without stroke or wound, rescue those breathing lives to die in beds, that here come sacrifices for the field. Preserve it not, but hear me, mighty kings. Speak on with favour, we are bent to hear. That daughter there of Spain, the Lady Blanche, is niece to England. Look upon the years of Louis the Dauphin and that lovely maid. If lusty love should go in quest, where should he find it fairer than in Blanche? If zealous love should go in search of virtue, where should he find veins bound richer blood than Lady Blanche? Such as she is a beauty, Virtue birth is the young Dauphin in every way complete. He is part of a blessed man, left it to be finished by such as she. And she is a fair divided excellence whose fullness of perfection lies in him. Oh, two such silver currents when they join do glorify the banks that bound them in and two such shores of two such streams made one. Two such controlling bounds shall you be kings to these two princes, if you marry them. This union shall do more than battery can to our fast closed gates, for at this match, with swifter spleen than power can enforce, the mouth of passage shall we fling wide open and give you entrance. But without this match, the sea enraged is not so half so deaf. Lions more confident, mountains and rocks more free from motion. No, not death himself in mortal fury half so perventory as we to keep the city. Here's a stay that shakes the rotten carcass of old death out of his rags. Here's a large mouth indeed that spits forth death in mountains, rocks and seas. Talks as familiarly of roaring lions as maids of 13 do of puppy dogs. <laughs> what cannon begot this lusty blood? 
He speaks plain cannon fire and smoke and bounce. He gives the bastinado with his tongue. Our ears are cudgelled. Not a word of his, but Buffett's better than the fist of France. Zooms! <laughs> I was never so bethumped with words since I first called my brother's father dad. Done. List to this conjunction. Make this match. Give with our niece a dowry large enough, for by this knot thou shalt so surely tie thy now unsured assurance to the crown, that yon green boy shall have no son to ripe the bloom that promiseth a mighty fruit. I see a yielding in the looks of France. Mark how they whisper. Urge them while their souls are capable of this ambition, lest zeal, now melted by the windy breath of soft petitions, pity and remorse, cool and congeal again to what it was. Why answer not the double majesties, this friendly treaty of our threatened town? Speak England first, that hath been forward first to speak unto this city, what say you? If that the Dauphin there, thy princely son, can look in this book of beauty read, I love. Her dowry shall equal way with a queen. For fair Anjou, fair Touraine, Maine, Poitiers, and all that we upon this side the sea, except this city now by us besieged, find liable to our crown and dignity, shall gild her bridal bed and make her rich in titles, honors, promotions, as she is in beauty, education, blood, holds hands with any princess of the world. What sayest thou, boy? Look in the lady's face. I do, my lord, and in her eye I find a wonder or a wondrous miracle, the shadow of myself formed in her eye, which being but the shadow of your son, becomes a son and makes your son a shadow. I, I do protest I never loved myself till now in fixed I beheld myself drawn in the flattering table of her eye. Drawn in the flattering table of her eye, to hang in the frowning wrinkle of her brow and quartered in her heart, he doth espy himself love's traitor. This is a pity. Now, that hanged and drawn and quartered there should be in such a love, so vile a lout as he. My uncle's will in this respect is mine. If he see aught in you that makes him like, that anything he sees which moves his liking, I can with ease translate it to my will. Or if you will, to speak more properly, I will enforce it easily to my love. Further, I will not flatter you, my lord, than this, that nothing do I see in you that I can find should merit any hate. What say these young ones? What say you, my niece? That she is bound in honour still to do what you, in wisdom, still vouchsafe to say? Speak then, Prince Dauphin. Can you love this lady? Nay, ask me if I can refrain from love. For I do love her most and fain. Then do I give Volcassin, Touraine, Maine, Poitiers, and Anjou, these five provinces with her to thee, and this addition more, full 30,000 marks of English coin. Philip of France, if thou be pleased with all, command thy son and daughter to join hands. It likes us well. Young princess, close your hands. And your lips too, for I am well assured that I did so when I was first assured. Now, citizens of Angers, ope your gates. Let in that amity which you have made. For at St. Mary's Chapel presently, the rites of marriage shall be solemnized. Is not the Lady Constance in this troop? I know she is not, for this match made up, her presence would have interrupted much. Where is she and her son? Tell me who knows. She is sad and passionate at your highness's tent. And by my faith, this league that we have made will give her sadness very little cure. Uh, brother of England, how may we content this widow lady? In her right we came, which 
God knows, have turned another way to our advantage. We will heal all up, for we'll create young Arthur, Duke of Bretagne and Earl of Richmond, and this rich fair town will make him Lord of. Call the Lady Constance, some, some speedy messenger, bid her repair to our solemnity. I trust we shall, if not, fill up the measure of her will, yet in some measure satisfy her so that we shall stop her exclamation. Go we, as well as haste will suffer us to this unlooked for and unprepared pomp. Mad world, mad kings, mad, Composition, John, to stop Arthur's title in the whole, hath willingly departed with a part. And France, whose armour conscience buckled on, whom zeal and, and charity brought to the field as God's own soldier, rounded in the ear with the same purpose changer, that sly devil, that broker, that still breaks pate of faith, that daily break vow, he that wins of all, of kings, of beggars, old men, young men, maids, who having no external thing to lose, but the word made, cheats the poor maid of that, that smooth faced gentleman tickling commodity, oh. <laughs> commodity, the bias of the world, the world who of itself is poised well, made to run even upon even ground, till this advantage, this vile, drawing bias, this sway of motion, this commodity makes it take head from all indifferency, from all direction, purpose, cause, intent, and this same bias, this commodity, this board, this broker, this all changing word clapped on the outward eye of fickle France hath drawn him from his own determined aid, from a resolved and honourable war to a most base and vile concluded peace. And why rail I on this commodity? Huh. But for because he hath not wooed me yet. Not that I have the power to clutch my hand when his fair angels would salute my palm. But for my hand is unattempted yet, like a, a poor beggar raileth on the rich. While, well, whilst I am a beggar, I will rail and say there is no sin but to be rich. And being rich, my virtue then shall be to say there is no vice but beggary. Since kings break faith upon commodity, gain, be my lord, for I will worship thee. Exeunt. Act three, scene one, the French king's tent. Enter Constance, Arthur, and Salisbury. Gone to be married? Gone to swear a peace? False blood to false blood join. Gone to be friends? Shall Louis have Blanche and Blanche those provinces? <laughs> it is not so. Thou hast a misspoke, misheard. Be well advised. Tell o'er thy tale again. It, it cannot be, but thou dost say tis so. I trust I may not trust thee, for thy word is but the vain breath of a common man. Believe me, I do not believe thee. Man, I have a king's oath to the contrary. Thou shalt be punished for thus frighting me. For I am sick and capable of fears, oppressed with wrongs and therefore full of fears. A widow, husbandless and subject to fears, a woman naturally born to fears. And though thou now confess thou didst but jest with my vexed, Spirit, I cannot take a truce, but they will quake and tremble all this day. What dost thou mean by shaking of thy head? Why dost thou look so sadly on my son? 
What means that hand upon that breast of thine? Why holds thine eye that lamentable room like a proud river peering o'er his bounds? Be these sad signs confirmers of thy words? Then, then speak again, not all thy former tale, but, but this one word, whether thy tale be true. As true as I believe you think them false, that give you cause to prove my saying true. Oh, if thou teach me to believe this sorrow, teach thou the sorrow to make me die. And let belief and life encounter so as does the fury of two desperate men, which in the very meeting fall and die. Louis Mary Blanche. Oh, boy. Then where art thou, France, friend with England? What becomes of me? Fellow, be gone. I cannot brook thy sight. This news hath made thee a most ugly man. What other harm have I, good lady, done, but spoke the harm that is by others done? Which harm itself, within itself, so heinous is, as it makes harmful all that speak of it? I do beseech you, madam, be content. If thou that bids me be content wert grim, ugly and slanderous to thy mother's womb, full of unpleasing blots and sightless stains, lame, foolish, crooked, swart, prodigious, patched with foul moles and eye-offending marks, I would not care. I then would be content, for then I should not love thee, no, nor thou become thy great birth, nor deserve a crown, but thou art fair. <laughs> and at thy birth, dear boy, nature and fortune joined to make thee great. Of nature's gifts thou mayest with lilies boast and with the half-blown rose. But fortune, oh, she is corrupted, changed, and won from thee. She adulterates hourly with thine uncle John and with her golden hand hath plucked on France to tread down fair respect of sovereignty and made his majesty the bod to theirs. France is a bod to fortune and King John, that strumpet fortune, that usurping John. Tell me, fellow, is not France forsworn? Envenom him with words or get thee gone and leave these woes alone, which I alone am bound to underbear. Uh, pardon me, madam, I may not go without you to the king's. Thou mayest, thou shalt, I will not go with me, thee. I will instruct my sorrows to be proud, for grief is proud and makes his owner stoop. To me and to my state of my great grief, let kings assemble, for my griefs so great that no supporter but the huge firm earth can hold it up. Here and my sorrows sit. Here is my throne. Bid kings come bow to it. <laughs> Tis true, fair daughter, and this Blessed day ever in France shall be kept festival. To solemnize this day, the glorious sun stays in his course and plays the alchemist, turning with splendor of his precious eye the meager, cloddy earth to glittering gold. The yearly course that brings this day about shall never see it but a holy day. A wicked day and not a holy day. <sighs> what hath this day deserved? What hath it done? that it in golden letters should be set among the high tides in the calendar. Nay, rather turn this day out of the week, this day of shame, oppression, perjury, or if it must stand still, let wives with child pray that their burdens may not fall this day, lest that their hopes prodigiously be crossed. But on this day, let Seamen fear no rack, no bargains break that are not this day made. This day, all things begun must come to ill end. Yea, faith itself to hollow falsehood change. By heaven, lady, you shall have no cause to curse the fair proceedings of this day. Have I not pawned to you, my majesty? You have beguiled me with a counterfeit resembling majesty, which being touched 
and tried proves valueless. You are forsworn, forsworn. You came in arms to spill mine enemy's blood, but now in arms you strengthen it with yours. The grappling vigor and rough frown of war is cold in amity and painted peace. And our oppression hath made up this league. Arm, arm you heavens against these perjured kings. A widow cries, be husband to me, heavens. Let not the hour of this ungodly day wear out the day in peace. But ere sunset set armed discord twixt these perjured kings. Hear me, oh, hear me. Lady Constant, peace. War, war, no peace, peace is to me a war. Oh, Limoges, oh, Austria, thou dost shame that bloody spoil, thou slave, thou wretch, thou coward, thou little valiant, great in villainy, thou ever strong upon the stronger side, thou fortune's champion that dost never fight but when her humorous ladyship is by to teach thee safety. Thou art perjured too and soothed up greatness. What a fool art thou, a ramping fool to brag and stamp and swear upon my party. Thou cold-blooded slave, hast thou not spoke like thunder on my side? Been sworn my soldier? bidding me depend upon thy stars, thy fortune, and thy strength. And dost thou now fall over to my foes? Thou wear a lion's hide, doff it for shame, and hang a calfskin on those recreant limbs. Oh, that a man should speak those words to me. And hang a calfskin on those recreant limbs. Oh, thou darest not say so, villain, for thy life. And hang a calf skin on those recreant limbs. We like this not, thou dost forget thyself. Here comes the holy legate of the Pope. Hail, you anointed deputies of heaven. To thee, King John, my holy errand is. I, Pandolf of fair Milan Cardinal, and from Pope Innocent, the legate here, do in his re name religiously demand why thou, against the church, our holy mother, so willfully dost spurn and force perforce keep Stephen Langton, chosen Archbishop of Canterbury, from that holy see? This in our foresaid Holy Father's name, Pope Innocent, I do demand of thee. What earthly name to interrogatories can taste the free breath of a sacred king? Thou canst not, Cardinal, devise a name so slight, unworthy, and ridiculous to charge me to an answer as the Pope. Tell him this tale, and from the mouth of England, and thus much more, that no Italian priest shall tithe or toll in our dominions. But as we, under heaven, our supreme head, so under him that great supremacy where we do reign, we will alone uphold without the assistance of a mortal hand. So tell the Pope, all reverend set apart to him and his usurped authority. Brother of England, you blaspheme in this. <sighs> Though you and all the kings of Christendom are led so grossly by this meddling priest, dreading the curse that money will buy out, and by the merit of vile gold, dross, dust, purchase, corrupted pardon of a man who in that sale sells pardon from himself, Though you and all the rest so grossly led, this juggling witchcraft with revenue cherish, yet I alone, alone do me oppose against the Pope. 
and do count his friends my foes. Then, by the lawful power that I have, thou shalt stand cursed and excommunicate, and blessed shall he be that doth revolt from his allegiance to an heretic, and meritorious shall that hand be called, canonized and worshipped as a saint that takes away by any secret course thy hateful life. O oh, lawful let it be that I have room with Rome to curse a while. Good father cardinal, cry thou amen to my keen curses, for without my wrong there is no tongue hath power to curse him right. There's law and warrant, lady, for my curse. And for mine too. When law can do no right, let it be lawful that law bar no wrong. Law cannot give my child his kingdom here, for he that holds the kingdom holds the law. Therefore, since law itself is perfect wrong, how can the law forbid my tongue to curse? Philip of France, on peril of a curse, let go the hand of that arch heretic and raise the power of France upon his head, unless he do submit himself to Rome. Looks thou pale, France, do not let go thy hand. Look to that devil, lest that friends repent, and by disjoining hands, hell lose a soul. King Philip, listen to the carnival. And hang a calf's skin on his recreant limbs. Well, Raffian, I must pocket up these wrongs, because... Preaches best may carry them. Philip, what sayest thou to the cardinal? What should he say, but as the cardinal? We thank you, Father, for the difference is purchase of a heavy curse from Rome or the life lost of England for a friend. Or go the easier. That's the curse of Rome. Oh, Louis, stand fast. The devil tempts thee here in likeness of a new untrimmed bride. The Lady Constance speaks not from her faith, but from her need. Oh. If thou grant my need, which only lives but by the death of faith, that need must needs infer this principle, that faith would live again by death of need. Oh, then tread down my need, and faith mounts up. Keep my need up, and faith is trodden down. The king is moved, and answers not to this. I'll be removed from him, and answer well. Who so, King Philip, hang no more in doubt? Hang nothing but a calf's skin, most sweet lout. I am perplexed and know not what to say. What canst thou say but will perplex thee more if thou stand excommunicate and cursed? Good reverend father, make my person yours and tell me how you would bestow yourself. This royal hand and mine are newly knit and the conjunction of our inward souls married in league coupled and linked together with all religious strength of sacred vows. The latest breath that gave the sound of words was deep sworn faith, peace, amity, true love between our kingdoms and our royal selves. And even before this truce, but knew before, no longer that we well can wash our hands to clap this royal bargain up of peace, heaven knows they were besmeared and overstained with slaughter's pencil, where revenge did paint the fearful difference of incensed kings. And shall these hands, so lately purged of blood, so newly joined in love, so strong in both, unyoke this seizure and this kind regret play fast and loose with faith? So jest with heaven? Make such unconstant children of ourselves as now again to snatch our palm from palm, unswear faith sworn, and on the marriage bed of smiling peace to march a bloody host and make a riot on the gentle brow of true sincerity. Oh, holy sir, my reverend father, let it not be so. Out of your grace, devise, ordain, impose some gentle order, and then we shall be blessed to do your pleasure and continue friends. All form is formless, order orderless, save what is opposite to England's love. Therefore, to arms be champion of our church, or let the church, our mother, breathe her curse, a mother's curse on her revolting son. France, 
thou mayst hold a serpent by the tongue, a cased lion by the mortal paw, a fasting tiger safer by the tooth, then keep in peace that hand which thou dost hold. I may disjoin my hand, but not my faith. So makes thou faith an enemy to faith, and like a civil war sets oath to oath thy tongue against thy tongue. Oh, let thy vow first made to heaven first be to heaven performed. That is to be the champion of our church. It is religion that doth make vows kept, but, but thou hast sworn against religion. Therefore, thy later vows against thy first is in thyself rebellion to thyself. And better conquest never canst thou make than arm thy constant and thy nobler parts against these giddy, loose suggestions upon which better part our prayers come in if thou vouchsafe them. But if not, then know the peril of our curses light on thee so heavy as thou shalt not shake them off, but in despair die under their black weight. Rebellion, fat rebellion, it will not be. No, will not a carve skin stop that mouth of thine? Father, to arms! Upon thy wedding day, against the blood that thou hast married, what shall our feast be kept with slaughtered men? Shall braying trumpets and loud churlish drums, clamours of hell, be measures to our pomp? Oh, husband, hear me! I, alack, how new is husband in my mouth, even for that name which till this time my tongue did ne'er pronounce. Upon my knee, I beg, go not to arms against mine uncle. Oh, upon my knee, made hard with kneeling, I do pray to thee, thou virtuous Dauphin, alter not the doom forethought by heaven. Now shall I see thy love. What motive may be stronger with thee than the name of wife? That which upholdeth him that he upholds his honour. Oh, thine honour, Louis, thine honour. I, I muse your majesty doth seem so cold when such profound respects do pull you on. I will denounce a curse upon his head. Thou shalt not need. England, I will fall from thee. <laughs> oh, 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 fair return of banished majesty! Oh, foul revolt of French inconstancy! France, thou shalt rue this hour within this hour. Oh, time the clock setter, that bald sexton, time! Is it as he will? Well then, France shall woo! The suns are cast with blood. Fair day, adieu! Which is the side that I must go withal? I am with both. Each army hath a hand, and in their rage, I having hold of both, they whirl asunder and dismember me. <laughs> Husband, I cannot pray that thou mayest win. Uncle, I needs must pray that thou mayest lose. Father, I may not wish the fortune thine. Grandam, I will not wish thy wishes thrive. Whoever wins, on that side shall I lose. Assured loss before the match be played. Lady, with me, with me thy fortune lies. There where my fortune lives, there my life dies. Cousin, go, draw our puissance together. France. I am burned upward in flaming wrath. A rage whose heat hath this condition that nothing can allay, nothing but blood. The blood and dearest valued blood of France. Thy rage shall burn thee up and thou shalt turn to ashes ere our blood shall quench that fire. Look to thyself. Thou art in jeopardy. No more than he that threats. To arms! Let's hide! Exit. Act three, scene two. The plains near Angiers.
Enter bastard with Austria's head. Now, by my life, this day grows wondrous hot. Some eerie devil hovers in the sky and pours down mischief. Austria's head lie there <laughs> while Philip breathes. <laughs> Hubert, keep this boy. Philip, make up. My mother is assailed in our tent, and Tain, I fear. My lord, I rescued her. Her highness is in safety, fear you not. But on my liege, the very little pains will bring this labour to a happy end. Exeunt. <laughs> Act three, scene three, the plains near Angiers. Enter King John, Eleanor, Arthur, Bastard and Hubert. So shall it be. Your grace shall stay behind so strongly guarded. Cousin, look not sad. Thy grandam loves thee, and thy uncle will, as dear be to thee, as thy father was. All this will make my mother die of grief. <sighs> Cousin, away for England. Haste before, and ere our coming, see thou shake the bags of hoarding abbots, imprisoned angels set at liberty, the fat ribs of peace must by the hungry now be fed upon. Use our commission in its utmost force. Bell, book, and candle shall not drive me back when gold and silver becks me to come on. I leave your highness. Grandam, I will pray, if ever I remember to be holy. <laughs> For your safe, fair safety, so I kiss your hand. Farewell, gentle cousin. Cuz, farewell. Oh, come hither, little kinsman, hark a word. Come, come hither, Hubert. Oh. My gentle Hubert, oh, we owe thee much. Within this wall of flesh there is a soul counts thee her creditor, and with advantage means to pay thy love, and, oh, my good friend, thy voluntary oath lives in this bosom, dearly cherished. Give me thy hand. I had a thing to say, but... <laughs> I will fit it with some better tune. By heaven, Hubert, I am almost ashamed to say what good respect I have of thee. I am much bound unto your majesty. Good friend, thou hast no cause to say so yet, but thou shalt have, and creep time ne'er so slow, yet it shall come for me to do thee good. I had a thing to say, but let it go. The sun is in the heaven, and the proud day, attended with the pleasures of the world, is all too wanton, too full of gourds to give me audience. If the midnight bell, with his iron tongue and brazen mouth, sound on into the drowsy race of night, if this same were a churchyard where we stand, and thou possessed with a thousand wrongs, or if thou couldst see me without eyes, hear me without ears and make reply without a tongue, using conceit alone without eyes, ears and harmful sound of words, then in despite of broodful watching day, I would unto thy bosom pour my thoughts, but oh, I will not. Yet I love thee well. And by my troth, I think thou lovest me well. So well that what you bid me undertake, though that my death were junk to my abbot, by heaven I would do it. Do not I know thou wouldst. Good Hubert, 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 throw thine eye 
on yon young boy. I tell you what, my friend, he is a very serpent in my way. And wheresoever this foot of mine doth tread, he lies before me. Dost thou understand me? Thou art his keeper. And I'll keep him so, that he shall not offend your majesty. Death. My lord. A grave. He shall not live. Enough. I could be merry now, Hubert. I love thee. Well, I'll not say what I intended for thee, remember. Madam, fare you well. I'll send these powers o'er to your majesty. My blessing go with you. For England, cousin, go. Hubert shall be your man. Attend on you or with all true duty. On towards Calais. Ho! Exeunt. Act three, scene four. The plains near Angiers. King oh. Philip, tent. Enter King Philip of France, Louis the Dauphin, and Pandolf. So, by a roaring tempest on the flood, a whole armado of convicted sail is scattered and disjoined from fellowship. Courage and comfort all shall yet go well. What can go well? when we have run so ill. Are we not beaten? Is not Angers lost, Arthur, Tain prisoner, diverse dear friends slain, and bloody England into England gone, or bearing interruption, spite of France? What he hath won, that he hath fortified. So hot a speed which such advice disposed, such temperate order with so fierce a cause, doth want example. Who hath read or heard of any kindred or action like to this? Well could I bear that England had that praise, so we could find some pattern of our shame. Look, who comes here? A grave unto a soul, holding the eternal spirit against her will in the vile prison of afflicted breath. I prithee, lady, go away with me. <sighs> Lo. Now, now see the issue of your peace. Patience, good lady. Comfort, gentle Constance. No, I defy all counsel, all redress, but that which ends all counsel, true redress. Death, death. Oh, amiable, lovely death, thou odoriferous stench. Sound rottenness arise forth from the couch of lasting night. Thou hate and terror to prosperity, and I will kiss thy detestable bones and put my eyeballs in thy vaulty brows and wring these fingers with thy household worms and stop this gap of breath with fulsome dust and be a a carrion monster like thyself. <laughs> Come, grin on me, and I will think thou smilest and bust thee as thy wife miseries love. Oh, come to me. Oh, fair affliction, peace. No, no, I will not, having breath to cry. Oh, that my tongue were in the thunder's mouth. Then with a passion would I shake the world and rouse from sleep that fell anatomy which cannot hear a lady's feeble voice, which scorns a modern invocation. Lady, you utter madness and not sorrow. Thou art not holy to belie me so. I am not mad. This hair I tear is mine. My name is Constance. I was Geoffrey's wife. Young Arthur is my son, and he is lost. I am not mad. I would to heaven I were. For then, tis like I should forget myself. <laughs> oh, if I could, what grief should I forget? Preach some philosophy to make me mad, and thou shalt be canonized, Cardinal, for being not mad, but sensible, 
of grief, my reasonable part produces reason, how I may be delivered of these woes and, and teaches me to kill or hang myself. If I were mad, I should forget my son and or madly think a babe of, a babe of clouts were he. I, I am not mad. Too well, too well, I feel the different plague of each calamity. Bind up those tresses. Oh, what love I note in the fair multitude of those her hairs, where but by chance a silver drop hath fallen. Even to that drop, 10,000 wiry friends do glue themselves in sociable grief like true inseparable faithful loves sticking together in calamity. To England, if you will. Bind up your hairs. Yes, yes. Mm. That I will. Uh, and, 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 and wherefore will I do it? I, I tore them from their bonds and, and cried aloud, oh, that these hands could so redeem my son as they have given these hairs their liberty. But now I envy at their liberty and will again commit them to their bonds because my, my poor child is a prisoner. And Father Cardinal, I have heard you say that we shall see and know our friends again in heaven. If that be true, I shall see my boy again. For since the birth of Cain, the first male child to him that did but yesterday suspire, there was not such a gracious creature born. But now will canker sorrow eat my bud and chase the native beauty from his cheek and he will look as hollow as a ghost, as dim and meager as an ague's fit, and so he'll die. <laughs> and rising so again, when I shall meet him in the court of heaven, I shall not know him. Therefore never, never must I behold my pretty Arthur more. You hold too heinous a respect of grief. He talks to me that never had a son. You are as fond of grief as of your child. Grief fills up the room of my absent child. Lies in his bed, walks up and down with me, puts on his pretty looks, repeats his words, remembers me of all his gracious parts, stuffs out his vacant garments with his form. Then have I reason to be fond of grief? Fare you well. Had you such a loss as I, I could give better comfort than you do. I will not keep this form upon my head when there is such disorder in my wit. Oh, Lord, my boy, my Arthur, my fair son, my life, my joy, my food, my all the world, my widow's comfort, and my sorrow's cure. I fear some outrage, and I'll follow her. There's nothing in this world can make me joy. Life is as tedious as a twice told tale, vexing the dull ear of a drowsy man, and bitter shame hath spoiled the sweet world's taste, that it yields not but shame and bitterness. Before the curing of a strong disease, even in the instant of repair and health, the fit is strongest. Evils that take leave on their departure most of all show evil. What have you lost by losing of this day? All days of glory, joy, and happiness. If you had won it, certainly you had. No. No, when fortune means to men most good, she looks upon them with a threatening eye. It is strange to think how much King John hath lost in this, which he accounts so clearly won. Are not you grieved that Arthur is his prisoner? Yes, as heartily as he is glad we have him. <laughs> your, your mind is all as youthful as your blood. Now, 
hear me speak with a prophetic spirit. For even the breath of what I mean to speak shall blow each dust, each straw, each little rub out of the path which shall directly lead thy foot to England's throne. And therefore mark, John has seized Arthur, and it cannot be that while warm life plays in that infant's veins, the misplaced John should entertain an hour, one minute, nay, one quiet breath of rest. A scepter snatched with an unruly hand must be as boisterously maintained as gained. And he that stands upon a slippery place makes nice of no vile hold to stay him up. That John may stand, then Arthur needs must fall. So be it, for it cannot be but so. But what shall I gain by young part Arthur's fall? You, in the right of Lady Blanche, your wife, may then make all the claim that Arthur did. <laughs> and lose it, and, and all as Arthur did. How green you are and fresh in this old world. John lays you plots. The times conspire with you. For he that steeps his safety in true blood shall find but bloody safety and untrue. This act, so evilly born, shall cool the hearts of all his people and freeze up their zeal, that none so small advantage shall step forth to check his reign, but they will cherish it. No natural exhalation in the sky, no scope of nature, no distempered day, no common wind, no custom event, but they will pluck away his natural cause and call them meteors, prodigies, and signs, abortives, presages, and tongues of heaven, plainly denouncing vengeance upon John. Uh, maybe he will not touch young Arthur's life, but hold himself safe in his prison. Oh, sir, when he shall hear of your approach, if that young Arthur be not gone already, even at that news he dies, and then the hearts of all his people shall revolt from him, and kiss the lips of an unacquainted change, and pick strong matter of revolt and wrath out of the bloody fingers' ends of John's. Methinks I see this Hurley all on foot. And oh, what better matter breeds for you than I have named? The bastard Falconbridge is now in England ransacking the church, offending charity. If but a dozen French were there in arms, they would be as a call to train 10,000 English to their side. Or as a little snow tumbled about and on becomes a mountain. Oh, noble Dauphin, go with me to the king. Tis wonderful what may be wrought out of their discontent now that their souls are top full of offense. For England go, I will whet on the king. Strong reasons make strong actions. Let us go. And if you say I, the king will not say no. Exeunt. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your five minute interval. You now have five minutes to refresh your drinks, refresh yourselves and prepare for the second half. If you have any questions for either myself or the production team, please do let us know. We might have time to squeeze a couple in. Otherwise, be ready to uh, start back in five minutes time. Thank you so much. Oh, and I see I currently still have the severed head of Limoges <laughs> accompanying me for this little announcement. There we go. Cleansed, cleansed. There we go. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. Hello there, Sarah. How are you? Hello. I'm all right. Gathering myself together. Again, yes, putting myself back scene. together after that. Yeah, that incredible last scene. What a place for uh, for the interval to come. I think it's because probably everybody needed a bit of decompression after that, right? Absolutely. Yes. Definitely yeah. a time to refresh. And yes. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, yeah. The Gird the loins half. for the all the action to come in the second half. Really okay. looking forward to it myself, I have to say. Um, <laughs> just seeing the audience, obviously there's a slight delay saying, she's behind you, which <laughs> is uh, uh, too true and uh, very helpful. <laughs> so thank you all for that. Uh, do uh, let me know if you have any questions for us. Otherwise, Sarah, I believe you have some new patrons to thank. 
I do indeed. So um, as every week we say a huge, huge thank you to everyone who continues to support this project and all of the wonderful um, actors and creative uh, theatre makers that are involved in bringing these shows to you every week. Uh, so um, I want to do a shout out for our new donors um, who have signed up this week. So a huge thank you to Deborah W, Margaret M, Patrick G, Lynn F, Sarah H and Anne B. So we really, really appreciate um, all of your donations. They mean so much to everyone involved. Um, and yes, if you would like to uh, tip your actors um, and contribute something to the funds, uh, the link to our Patreon is in the description of this video. Um, and any, any amount that you're able to give is hugely, hugely uh, welcomed and, and we are very grateful for. Absolutely. You can give us as little as £1.20 a month, uh, which works out at about probably 35 pence a show or something like that. I'm not particularly good at math, I have to say. Uh, but thank you to all of our patrons for your continued support. It really does mean the world. Uh, we are distributing all of these funds out to uh, all those who choose to opt in uh, as a result of having lost work due to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic worldwide, shutting down uh, all the theatres. Um, for it would seem an indeterminate amount of time and unfortunately some of them even forever so anything that you can give uh, will be massively massively appreciated so thank you all so much for that if you're enjoying the show so far please do like this video and please subscribe to the youtube channel so that you can join us next week for an alumni cast reading of the merchant of venice which we're already tremendously excited about putting together for you next week it's going to be Brilliant. So we now have two minutes on the clock. This is your two minute call. So please make sure that you've prepared your snacks and drinks and all the rest of it and you are uh, ready to start for our second half. I can see just a couple of questions sneaking in here. Have you yes. got any on your side, Sarah? Uh, I did. I saw one which was um, what surprised us when we first read this play, which was a matter of days ago. <laughs> Yes, yeah, 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 absolutely. I think we had about two days lead time on the cast uh, where we were feverishly reading, editing and dramaturging and R&Ding uh, all of the text. Uh, this is not one that I was familiar with before uh, addressing it for this production. Uh, and so I was surprised by uh, genuinely every single thing in it. Um, the verse, as, um, as Gemma pointed out, is absolutely tremendous. Uh, the complexity of that verse, actually, I think has taken a real ramp up uh, and quite a sudden ramp up in complexity uh, over some of the uh, earlier histories that we've dealt with. I think also um, the bastard and the character of the bastard, for me, uh, had a real magnetic magnetic attraction as a as a person of working class origins the idea that you could have an illegitimate say to two kings listen to me uh the the kind of the gall that it takes to do that and then the fact that he's successful and then also the fact that the citizen uh, comes out of nowhere with uh, an idea that is better than any that anyone else has had and they actually go along with that idea um, there, there's so many extraordinary moments in this play it's why the game was chosen to say like spot the points at which the plot just takes a, a 90 degree uh, turn right because for me this is one of the most surprising plays not just because I haven't read it before uh, but also because of the extraordinary journey that it goes on between the expectations that the characters bring into the scene and then the reality that they are then confronted with so I hope that that's coming across to you uh, and thank you so much for your questions I believe that we are now ready to commence with the second half so uh, Sarah if you would like to uh, join the actors in the tiring house uh, I will uh, read us in so ladies and gentlemen I hope that you are uh, happy and comfortable uh, for we are about to present to you with the second half of the life and death of King John Act 4 Scene 1 Northampton, a room in the castle. Enter Hubert and executioner with rope and irons. Give me these irons, hot, and look thou stand within the arras. When I strike my foot upon the bosom of the ground, rush forth and bind the boy which you shall find with me fast to the chair. Be heedful, hence, and watch. I hope your warrant will bear out the deed. Uncleanly scruples, fear not you. Look to it. Young lad. Come forth, I have to say with you. Good morrow, Hubert. Good morrow, little prince. As little prince, having so great a title to be more prince as may be. You are sad. Indeed, I have been merrier. Mercy on me. 
Methinks nobody should be sad but I. Yet I remember when I was in France, young gentlemen would be as sad as night, only for wantonness. By my Christendom, so I were out of prison and kept sheep. I should be as merry as the day is long, and so I would be here. But that I doubt my uncle practised is more harm to me. He is afraid of me as and I of him. Is it my fault I was Geoffrey's son? No, indeed it's not, and I would to heaven I were your son. So you would love me, Hubert. If I talk to him, this innocent prate, he will awake my mercy, which lies dead. Therefore, I will be sudden and dispatch. Are you sick, Hubert? You look pale today. In sooth, I would you were a little sick, that I might sit all night and watch with you. I warrant I love you more than you do me. His words do take possession of my bosom. Read here, young Arthur. How oh, now, foolish shrew, turning this piteous torture out of door. I must be brief, lest resolution drop out at mine eyes in tender womanish tears. Can you not read it? Is it not fair writ? Too fairly, Hubert, for so foul effect. Must you, with hot irons, burn out both mine eyes? Young boy, I must. And will you? And I will. Have you the heart? When your head did but ache, I knit my hand at her about your brows, the best I had. A princess wrought at me, and I did never ask at you again. And with my hand at midnight held your head, and like the watchful minutes to the hour, still and anon cheered up the heavy time, saying, what lack you? And where lies your grief? Saying, what good love may I perform for you? Many a poor man's son would have lain still, and ne'er have spoke a loving word to you, but you at your sick service had a prince. Nay, you may think my love was crafty love and call it cunning. Do, and if you will, if heaven be pleased that you must use me ill, why then you must. Will you put out mine eyes? These eyes that never did, nor never shall so much as frown on you. I have sworn to do it, and with hot iron must I burn them out. Oh, none but in this iron age would do it. The iron of itself, though heat red hot, approaching near these eyes, would drink my tears and quench his fiery indignation, even in the matter of mine innocence. Nay, after that, consume away in rust, but for containing fire to harm mine eye. Are you more stubborn hard than hammered iron? And if an angel should have come to me and told me Hubert should put out mine eyes, I would not have believed him. No tongue but Hubert's. Come forth. What I would you do? Oh, save me, Hubert, save me. My eyes are out, even with the fierce looks of these bloody men. Give me the iron, I say, and bind him here. Alas, what need you be so boisterous rough? I will not struggle. I will stand stone still. Oh, for heaven's sake, Hubert, let me not be bound. Nay, hear me, Hubert. Drive these men away, and I will sit as quiet as a lamb. I will not stir, nor wince, nor speak a word, nor look upon the iron angrily. Thrust but these men away, and I'll forgive you, whatever torment you do put me to. Go stand with him. Let me alone with him. I am best pleased to be from such a deed. Alas, then I have chid away my friend. He hath a stern look, but a gentle heart. Let him come back, that his compassion may give life to yours. Come, boy, prepare yourself. Is there no remedy? None but to lose your eyes. Oh, heaven, that there were but a mote in yours, a grain, a dust, a gnat, a wandering hair. Any annoyance in that precious sense? And feeling what small things are boisterous there, your vile intent must needs seem horrible. Is this your promise? Go to hold your tongue. Hubert, the utterance of a brace of tongues must need want pleading for a pair of eyes. Let me not hold my tongue. Let me not, Hubert. Or, oh, Hubert, if you will, cut out my tongue so I may keep mine eyes. Oh, spare mine eyes, though to no use but still to look on you. No, 
apply my troth, the, the instrument is cold and would not harm me. I can heat it, boy. In good sooth, the fire is dead with grief, being created for comfort to be used in undeserved extremes. See else for yourself. There is no malice in this burning coal. The breath of heaven hath blown his spirit out and strewed repented ashes on his head. But with my breath, I can revive it, boy. And if you do, you will but make it blush and glow with the shame of your proceedings, Hubert. Nay, it perchance will sparkle in your eyes, and like a dog that is compelled to fight, snatch at his master that doth tar him on. All things that you should use to do me wrong deny their office. Only you do lack that mercy which fierce fire and iron extends. Creatures of note for mercy lacking uses. Well, see to live. I will not touch thine eye for all the treasure that thine uncle owes. Yet am I sworn, and I did purpose, boy, with this same very iron to burn them out. Oh, now you look like Hubert. All this while you were disguised. Peace, no more. Could you? Your uncle must not know, but you are dead. I'll fill these dogged spies with false reports. And pretty child. Sleep doubtless and secure that Hubert, for the wealth of all of the world, will not offend thee. Oh, heaven, I thank you, Hubert. Silence, no more. Go closely in with me. Much danger do I undergo for thee. Exeunt. Act four, scene two. A room in King John's castle. Enter King John, Pembroke, Salisbury, and Lords. Here once again we sit, once again. Crowned. Long live the, the king. king. And looked upon, I hope, with cheerful eyes. This once again, but that your highness pleased, was once superfluous. You were crowned before, and that high royalty was ne'er plucked off, the face of men ne'er stained with revolt, fresh expectation troubled not the land with any longed-for change or better state. Therefore, to be possessed with double pomp, to guard a title that was rich before, to gild refined gold, to paint the lily, to throw a perfume on the violet, to smooth the ice or add another hue unto the rainbow, or with tapered light to seek the beauteous eye of heaven to garnish is wasteful and ridiculous excess. But that your royal pleasure must be done, this act is as an ancient tale new told and in the last repeating troublesome. It's being urged at a time unseasonable. In this, the antique and well-noted face of plain old form is much disfigured, and like a shifted wind unto a sail, it makes the course of thoughts to fetch about, startles and frights consideration, makes sound opinion sick, and truth suspected, for putting on so new a fashioned robe. When workmen strive to do better than well, they do confound their skill in covetousness. Hmm? And oftentimes excusing of a fault doth make the fault the worse by the excuse. As patches set upon a little breach discredit more in hiding of the fault than did the fault before it was so patched. To this effect, before you were new crowned, we breathed our counsel, but it pleased your highness inappropriate consideration to overbear it. And we are all well pleased, since all and every part of what you would doth make a stand at what your highness will. Some reasons of this double coronation I have possessed you with, and think them strong and more. 
more strong than lesser is my fear, I shall endue you with. Meantime, but ask what you would have reformed that is not well, and well shall you perceive how willingly I will both hear and grant you your requests. Then uh, I, as one that am the tongue of these to sound the purposes of all their hearts, both for myself and them, but chief of all, your safety, for the which myself and them bend their best studies, heartily request the enfranchisement of Arthur, uh, whose restraint doth move the murmuring lips of discontent. Uh, they break into this, this dangerous argument. If Oh, what in rest you have, oh, what in right you hold, why then your fears, which as they say, attend the steps of wrong, they should move you to mew up your tender kinsman and to choke his days with barbarous ignorance and deny his youth the rich advantage of good exercise. <sighs> that, that the time's enemies may not have this to grace occasions. Let it be our suit, huh? That you have bid us ask his liberty, which for our goods we do no further ask than whereupon our wheel on you depending counts at your wheel that he have his liberty. Let it be so. I do commit his youth to your direction. Hubert, what news with you? This is the man should do the bloody deed. Yeah, he, he showed his warrant to a friend of mine. The image of a wicked, heinous fault lives in his eye. That close aspect of his doth show the mood of a much troubled breast. And oh, I do fearfully believe it is done. Oh, what we so feared he had the charge to do. The colour of the king doth come and go between his purpose and his conscience, like heralds twixt two dreadful battles set. His passion is so ripe, mm -hmm. it needs must explode. And when it breaks, it, I fear, will issue thence the foul corruption of a sweet child's death. We cannot hold morality's strong hand. Good lords. Although my will to give is living, mm -hmm. the suit which you demand is gone and dead. He tells us Arthur is deceased tonight. Indeed, we feared his sickness was past cure. Indeed, we heard how near his death he was before the child himself felt he was sick. This must be answered here or hence. Why do you bend such solemn brows on me? Think you I bear the shears of destiny? Have I commandment on the pulse of life? It is apparent foul play, and tis shame that greatness should so grossly offer it, so thrive it in your game, and so farewell. Mm, stay, yet so Lord Salisbury, I'll go with thee, and find the inheritance of this poor child his little kingdom of a forced grave. That blood, which owed the breath of all this isle, three-foot of it doth hold. Ah! Bad world the while, this must not be thus born. This will break out to all our sorrows. And you're long, I doubt. They burn in indignation. I repent. There is no sure foundation set on blood, no certain life achieved by others' death. A fearful eye thou hast. Where is that blood that I have seen inhabit those cheeks? So foul a sky clears not without a storm, pour down thy weather. How does it go in France? From France to England, never such a power for any foreign preparation was levied in the body of a land. The copy of your speed is learned by them. For when you should be told they to prepare, then tidings comes that they are arrived. Ha! Where hath our intelligence been drunk? 
where hath it slept? Where is my mother's care that such an army could be drawn in France and she not hear of it? My liege, her ear is stopped with dust. The first of April died, your noble mother. And as I hear, my lord, the lady Constance in a frenzy died three days before. But this from rumor's tongue I idly heard, if true or false I know not. With all thy speed, dreadful occasion. Oh, make a league with me till I have pleased my discontented peers. What? Mother dead. How wildly then walks my estate in France? Under whose conduct came those powers of France that thou for truth gearst out are landed here? Under the Dauphin. <gasps> thou hast made me giddy with these ill tidings. Now, what says the world to your proceedings? Do not seek to stuff my head full of more ill news, for it is full. But if you be afeard to hear the worst, then let the worst unheard fall on your head. Bear with me, cousin, for I was amazed under the tide. But now I breathe again, aloft the flood, and kin can give audience to any tongue. Speak it of what it will. How I have sped among the clergymen, the sums I have collected shall express. But as I travelled hither through the land, I find the people strangely fantasied, possessed with rumours full of idle dreams, not knowing what they fear, but full of fear. And here's a prophet that I brought with me from forth the streets of Pomfret, whom I found with many hundreds treading on his heels, to whom he sung in rude, harsh-sounding rhymes that ere the next ascension day at noon, your highness should deliver up your crown. Thou idle dreamer, wherefore did thou so? For knowing that the truth will fall out so. Hubert, away with him, imprison him. And on that day at noon, whereon he says, I shall yield up my crown, let him be hanged. Deliver him to safety and return, for I must needs use you. Oh, my gentle cousin, hearst thou the news aboard, who are arrived? French, my lord. Men's mouths are full of it. Besides, I met Lord Bigot and Lord Salisbury with eyes as red as new kindled fire, and others more going to seek the grave of Arthur, whom they say is killed tonight on your suggestion. Gentle kinsmen, go and thrust thyselves into their companies. I have a way to win their loves again. Bring them before me. I will seek them out. Nay, but make haste. The better foot before. Oh. Let me have no subject enemies when adverse foreigners affright my towns with dreadful pomp of stout invasion. Be Mercury, set feathers to thy heels and fly like thought from them to me again. Spirit of the time shall teach me speed. Spoke like a sprightful noble gentleman. Go after him, for he perhaps shall need some messenger betwixt me and the peers. Be thou he. Oh, my heart, my liege. My mother, dead. My lord, they say five moons were seen tonight, four fixed and the fifth did whirl about, now the four in wondrous motion. Five moons? Old men and beldams in the streets do prophesy upon it dangerously. Young Arthur's death is common in their mouths, and when they talk of him, they shake their heads and whisper one another in their ear. And he that speaks doth gripe the hearer's wrist, whilst he that hears makes fearful action with wrinkled brows, with nods, with rolling eyes. I saw a smith stand with his hammer thus, the whilst his iron did on the anvil cool, with open mouth swallowing a tailor's news, who, with his shears and measure in his hand, standing on slippers, which his nimble haste had falsely thrust upon contrary feet. 
told of a many thousand warlike French that were embattled and ranked in Kent and ranked another lean unwashed artificer cuts off his tail and talks of Arthur's death. Why seekest thou to possess me with these fears? Why urgest thou so oft young Arthur's death? Thy hand hath murdered him. I heard Marty cause to wish him dead, but thou hast none to kill him. Who had my lord? Why did you not provoke me? It is the curse of kings to be attended by slaves that take their humours for a warrant to break within the bloody house of life and on the winking of authority to understand a law to know the meaning of dangerous majesty when perchance it frowns more upon humour than advised respect. Here is your hand and seal for what I did. Oh. When the last account twixt heaven and earth is to be made, then shall this hand and seal witness against us to our damnation. <sighs> How oft the sight of means to do ill deeds makes ill deeds done. Hadst thou not been by, a fellow by the hand of nature marked, quoted and signed to do a deed of shame, this murder had not come into my mind. But taking note of thy abhorred aspect, finding thee fit for bloody villainy, Act, liable to be employed in danger, I faintly broke with thee of Arthur's death, and thou, to be endeared to a king, made it no conscience to destroy a prince. My lord, I... Hadst thou but shook thy head, or made a pause when I spake darkly what I purposed, or turned an eye of doubt upon my face, and bid me tell my tale and express words, deep shame had struck me dumb made me break off and those thy fears might have wrought fears in me but thou did understand me by my signs and didst uh, in signs again parley with sin yea without stop didst let thy heart consent and consequently thy rude hand to act the deed which both our tongues held vile to name out of my sight and never see me more. My nobles, leave me and my state is braved. Even at the gates with ranks of foreign powers, nay, in this body of this fleshy land, this kingdom, this confine of blood and breath, hostility and civil tumult reigns between my conscience and my cousin's death. Arm you against your other enemies and make a peace between your soul and you. Young Arthur is alive. This hand of mine is yet a maiden and an innocent hand, not painted with the crimson spots of blood. Within this bosom never entered yet the dreadful motion of a murderous thought, and you have slandered nature in my form, which howsoever rude exterior is yet the cover of a fairer mind than to be butcher of an innocent child. Does Arthur live? Haste thee to the peers and throw this report on their incensed rage. Make them tame for their obedience. Forgive the comment that my passion made upon thy feature, for my rage was blind and foul imaginary eyes of blood presented thee more hideous than thou art. Oh, answer me not, but to my closet bring the angry lords with all expedient haste. I conjure thee but slowly. Run more fast. Exeunt. Act four, scene three, before King John's castle. Enter Arthur on the walls.
Good ground be pitiful and hurt me not. There's few or none do know me. If they did, this shipboy semblance hath disguised me quite. I am afraid, and yet I'll venture it. If I get down and do not break my limbs, I'll find a thousand shifts to get away. As good to die and go, as die and stay. Lords, I will meet him at St. Edmundsbury. It is our safety and we must embrace this gentle offer of the perilous time. Who brought that letter from the Cardinal? Oh, the Count Melun, a noble Lord of France, whose private with me of the Dauphin's love is much more general than these lines import. Tomorrow morning, let us meet him then. Or rather than set forward, for it will be two long days journey, Lords, or ere we meet. But once more today we'll meet distempered lords. The king by me requests your present strength. Oh, the king have dispossessed himself of us. We will not line his thin, bestained cloak with our pure honours, nor attend the foot that leaves the print of blood where'er it walks. Return and tell him so. We know the worst. Whatever you think, good words I think were best. Our griefs and not our manners reason now. There is little reason in your grief. Therefore, it were reason you had manners now. Sir, sir, impatience hath his privilege. Tis true. To hurt his master, no man else. This is the prison. What is he lies here? Oh. Oh, death, <laughs> made proud with pure and princely beauty. The earth had not a hole to hide this deed. Oh, murder, as hating what himself hath done, doth lay it open to urge on revenge. When he doomed this beauty to a grave, found it too precious princely for a grave. Sir Richard, what think you? Have you beheld, or have you read, or heard, or could you think, or, or do you almost think, although you see that you do see, or could thought without this object form such another? This is the very top, the height, the, the crest, the crest unto the crest of murder's arms. Oh, this is the bloodiest shame, the wildest savagery, the vilest stroke that ever wall-eyed wrath or staring rage presented to the tears of soft remorse. All murders past do stand excused in this, and, and this so soul and so unmatchable shall give a holiness, a purity to the yet unbegotten sin of times. And prove a deadly bloodshed by the jest. Exampled by this heinous spectacle. It is a damned and bloody work, the graceless action of a heavy hand, if it be the work of any hand. What if that be the work of any hand? We had a kind of light that would ensue. It is the shameful work of Hubert's hand. The practice and the purpose of the king from whose obedience I forbid my soul kneeling before this ruin of sweet life and breathing to his breathless excellence the innocence of a vow, a holy vow, never to taste the pleasures of the world, never to be infected with delight, nor conversant with ease and idleness till I have set a glory to this hand by giving it the worship of revenge. 
our souls, our souls do religiously, religiously confirm thy words. Lords, I am hot with haste to seeking you. Arthur doth live. The king hath sent for you. Oh, he is bold and blushes not at death. Avaunt, thou hateful villain. Get thee gone. I am no villain. Oh, must I rob the law? Your sword is bright, sir. Put it up again. Not till I sheathe it in a murderer's skin. Stand back, Lord Salisbury. Stand back, I say. By heaven, I think my sword's as sharp as yours. I would not have you, Lord, forget yourself, nor tempt the danger of my true defence, lest I, by making of your rage, forget your worth, your greatness, and nobility. Out, Dunghill, dost thou brave a nobleman? Not for my life, but yet I dare defend my innocent life against an emperor. But thou art a murderer! Do not prove me so, yet I am none. Whose tongue soever speaks false, not truly speaks. Who speaks not truly lies? I cut him to pieces. To peace, I say. Oh, stand by, or I shall gall you, Falconbridge. Thou wert better gall the devil, Salisbury, if thou but frown on me, or stir thy foot, or teach thy hasty spleen to do me shame, I'll strike thee dead. Put up thy sword betime, or I'll so maul you and your toasting iron, that you shall think the devil is come from hell. What wilt thou do, renowned Falconbridge, second a villain and a murderer? Lord Bigot, I am none. Who killed this prince? It is not an hour since I left him well. I honoured him. I loved him. And will weep my date of life out for his sweet life's loss. Oh, trust not these cunning waters of his eyes, for villainry is not without such room. And he long traded in it, makes it seem like rivers of remorse and innocency. Away with me, all you whose souls abhor the uncleanly savours of a slaughterhouse, for I am stifled with the smell of sin. Away to Woodbury, to the Dauphin there. There, tell the king. He may inquire us. Out. Oh, here's a good world. Knew you of this fair work beyond the infinite and boundless reach of mercy. If thou didst this deed of death, art thou damned, Hubert? Do hear me, sir. <laughs> I will tell thee what. Thou art damned as black. Nay, nothing is so black. Thou art more deep damned than Prince Lucifer. There is not yet so ugly a fiend of hell as thou shalt be if thou didst kill this child. Upon my soul! If I... thou didst but consent to this most cruel act, do but despair. And if thou wast accord, the smallest thread that ever spider twisted from her web with, will serve to strangle thee. A rush will be a beam to hang thee on, or wouldst thou drown thyself? Put but a little water in a spoon, and it shall be as the ocean, enough to stifle such a villain up. I do suspect thee very grievously. I, in act, consent, O oh, sin of thought, be guilty of stealing that sweet breath, which was embounded in this beauteous claim. Let hell one pains enough to torture me. I left him well. Go. Bear him in thine arms. I am amazed, methinks, and, and lose my way among the thorns and dangers of this world. How easy dost thou take all England up from forth this morsel of dead royalty? The life, the right and truth of all this realm is fled to heaven. And England now is left to tug and scamble and to part by the teeth of the unowed interests of proud swelling state. Now powers from home and discontents at home meet in one line. And vast confusion waits as doth a raven on a sick fallen beast the imminent decay of wrestle pomp. Now happy. He whose cloak and cincture can hold out this tempest. Bear that child away and follow me with speed 
Oh, to the king, a thousand businesses, a brief in hand, and heaven itself doth frown upon the land. Exeunt, Act 5, Scene 1, King John's Palace. Enter King John and Pandolf. Thus have I yielded up into your hand the circle of my glory. Take again from this my hand as holding of the Pope your sovereign greatness and authority. Now, keep your holy word. Go meet the French and from his holiness use all your power to stop their marches for we are inflamed. Our discontented counties do revolt, our people quarrel with obedience, swearing allegiance to the love of soul, to stranger blood, to foreign royalty. This inundation of mistempered humour rests by you only to be qualified. Then pause not for the present time so sick that present medicine must be ministered or overthrow incurable ensues. It was my breath that blew this tempest up upon your stubborn usage of the Pope. But since you are a gentle convertite, my tongue shall hush again this storm of war and make fair weather in your blustering land. On this ascension day, remember well, upon your oath of service to the Pope, go I to make the French lay down their arms. Is this ascension day? D did not the prophet say that before ascension day at noon, my crown I should give off? Even so I have. I did suppose it should be on constraint, but heaven be thankful, it is but voluntary. All Kent hath yielded. Nothing there holds out but Dover Castle. London hath received like a kind host the Dauphin and his powers. Your nobles will not hear you, but are gone to offer service to your enemy. And wild amazement hurries up and down the little number of your doubtful friends. Would not my lords return me again after they heard young Arthur was alive? They found him dead and cast into the streets. An empty casket where the jewel of life by some damned hand was robbed and taken away. That villain Hubert told me he did live. So on my soul he did, for aught he knew. Jeffrey, wherefore do you droop? Why look you sad? Be great in act as you have been in thought. Let not the world see fear and sad distrust govern the motion of the kingly eye. Be stirring as the time. Be fire with fire. Threaten the threatener and outface the brow of bragging horror. So shall inferior eyes that borrow their behaviours from the great grow great by your example and put on the dauntless spirit of resolution away and glister like of the god of war when he intended to become the field show boldness and aspiring confidence what shall they seek the lion in his den and fight him there and make him tremble there oh let it not be said forage and run to meet displeasure farther from the doors and grapple with him or ere he comes so nigh. The legate of the Pope hath been with me and I have made a happy peace with him and he hath promised to dismiss the powers led by the Dauphin. Oh, in glorious leave. Shall we, upon the footing of our land, send fair play orders and make compromise, insinuation, parley, and base truce to arms invasive. Shall a beardless boy, a cockered, silken, silken wanton, brave our fields and flesh his spirit in the warlike soil, mocking the air with colours idly spread and find no check? Let us 
my liege, two arms. Perchance the cardinal cannot make your peace. Or if you do, let it be least be said they saw we had purpose of defence. Have thou the ordering of this present time. Away then, with good courage. Yet I know our party may well meet a prouder foe. Exeunt, Act 5, Scene 2, The French Camp at St Edmundsbury. Enter in arms Louis the Dauphin, Salisbury, Maloon, Pembroke and Bigot. My Lord Maloon, let this be copied out and keep it safe for our remembrance. Return the president to these lords again, that having our fair order written down, both they and we, perusing over these notes, may know wherefore we took the sacrament and keep our faiths firm and inviolable. Upon our sides it never shall be broken. And noble Dauphin, albeit we swear a voluntary zeal and an unurged faith to your proceedings. Yet, believe me, Prince, I am not glad that such a sore of time should seek a plaster by condemned revolt and heal the inveterate canker of one wound by making many. Oh, it grieves my soul that I must draw this metal from my side to be a widow maker. And there were honourable rescue and defence cries out upon the name of Salisbury. But such is the infection of the time that for the health and physic of our right, we cannot deal but with the very hand of stern injustice and confused wrong. It's not pity. Oh, my grieved friends, that we, the sons and children of this isle, were born to see so sad an hour as this, wherein we step after a stranger, march upon her gentle bosom, and fill up her enemies' ranks. I must withdraw and weep upon this spot of this enforced cause, to grace the gentry of a land remote and follow unacquainted colours here. What here? Oh, nation that thou couldst remove, or that Neptune's arms who clippeth thee about would bear thee from the knowledge of thyself. A noble temple, temper dost thou show in this, and great afflictions wrestling in thy bosom doth make an earthquake of nobility. Oh, what a noble combat hast thou fought between compulsion and brave respect. Let me wipe off this honorable dew that silvery doth progress on thy cheeks. Oh, my heart hath melted at a lady's tears, being an ordinary indignation. But this effusion of such manly drops that shower blown up by a tempest of thy soul startles mine eyes and makes me more amazed than had I seen the valued top of heaven figured quite o'er with burning meteors. Lift up thy brow, renowned Salisbury, and with a great heart heave away this storm. Come, come. For thou shalt trust thy hand as deep into the purse of rich prosperity as Louis himself. So nobles, so nobles shall you all, and knit your sinews to the strength of mine, and even there methinks an angel's faith. Look where the holy legate comes apace to give us warrant from the hand of heaven, and on our actions set the name of right with holy breath. Hail, noble prince of France, the next is this, King John hath reconciled himself to Rome. His spirit is come in that so stood out against the holy church, the great metropolis and sea of Rome. Therefore thy threatening colors now wind up and tame the savage spirit of wild war that like a lion fostered up at hand, it may lie gently at the foot of peace and be no further harmful than in show. <laughs> Your grace shall pardon me. I will not back. I am too high born to be profited, to be a secondary at control, or 
useful serving man and instrument to any sovereign state throughout the world. <laughs> Your breath first kindled the dead coals of war between this chastised kingdom and myself and brought in matter that should feed this fire. And now it is far too huge to be blown out with that same weak wind which enkindled it. You taught me how to know the face of right, acquainted me with interest to this land, yea, thrust this enterprise into my heart. And come ye now to tell me that John hath made his peace with Rome? What peace is that to me? I, by the honor of my marriage bed, after young Arthur, claim this land for mine. And now it is half conquered, must I back? Because that John hath made his peace with Rome. Am I Rome's slave? What penny hath Rome borne? What men provided? What munitions sent to undergo this action? Is not I that undergo this charge? Who else but I, such as to my claim are liable, sweat in the business and maintain this war? Have I not heard these islanders shout out, Vive Lura, as I have bent on their towns? Have I not here the best cards for the game to win this easy match played for a crown? And shall I now give o'er the yielded set? No, no, on my soul, it shall never be set. You look but on the outside of this work. Outside or inside, I will not return to my attempts so much be glorified as to my of ample hope was promised before I drew this gallant head of war and called these fiery spirits from the world to outlook conquest and to win renown, even in the jaws of danger and of death. What lusty trumpet thus doth summon us? According to the fair play of the world, let me have audience. I am sent to speak. My holy lord of Milan from the king, I come to learn how you have dealt for him. And as you answer, I do know the scope and warrant limited onto my tongue. The Dauphin is too willful opposite and will not temporize with my entreaties. He flatly says he will not lay down his arms. By all the blood, that ever fury breathe. The youth says, well, now hear our English king, for thus his royalty doth speak in me. He is prepared and reason too he should. This apish and unmannerly approach of this harnessed mask and unadvised revel, this unhaired sauciness and boyish troops, the king doth smile at and is well prepared to whip this dwarfish war this pygmy arms from out the circle of his territories that hand which had the strength even at your door to cudgel you and make you take the hatch to dive like buckets in concealed wells to hug with swine to seek sweet safety out in vaults and prisons and to thrill and shake even at the crying of your nation's crow thinking this voice an armed Englishman Shall that victorious hand be feebled here that in your chambers gave you chastisement? No. No, the gallant monarch is in arms. And you, degenerates, you ingrate revolts, you bloody Nero's ripping up the womb of your dear mother England, blush for shame for your own ladies and pale visage maids, like Amazons come tripping after drums, their thimbles into armed gauntlets change, their needles to lances, and their gentle hearts to fierce and bloody inclination. Bear in thy grave and turn thy face in peace. We grant thou canst outscold us. Fare thee well. We hold our time too precious to be spent with such a brabbler. Give me leave to speak. No, I will speak. We will attend to neither. Strike up the drums and let the tongue of ward plead for our interest and our being here. Indeed, your drums 
being beaten will cry out, and so shall you, being beaten. Do but start and echo with the clamour of thy drum, and even at the hand a drum is ready braced that shall reverberate as loud as thine. Sound but another, and another shall as loud as thine, rattle with the welkin's ear, and mock the deep mouthed thunder. For at hand, not trusting to this halting legate here, whom he hath used rather for sport than need, is the warlike John. And in his forehead sits a bare-ribbed death, whose office in this day to feast upon the whole thousands of the French. Break up our drums! to find this danger out. And thou shalt find it, Dauphin, do not doubt. Exeunt, act five, scene three, the battlefield. Enter King John and Hubert. How goes the day with us? Oh, tell me, Hubert. Hardly, I fear. How fares your majesty? This fever that hath troubled me so long, lies heavy on me. Oh, my heart is sick. My lord, your valiant kinsman, Falconbridge, desires your majesty to leave the field and send him word by me which way you go. Tell him towards Swinstead, to the abbey there. Be of good comfort for the great supply that was expected by the Dauphin here, a wrecked three nights ago on Goodwin Sands. <gasps> this news was brought to Richard Buddy now. The French fight coldly and retire themselves. I me, mean, this tyrant fever burns me up and will not let me welcome this good news. <clears throat> Set on towards Swinstead to my litter straight. Weakness possesseth me and I am faint. Exeunt. Act 5, Scene 4. Another part of the battlefield. Enter Salisbury, Pembroke and Bigot. Oh, I did not think the king so stored with friends. Up, up, uh, uh, once again, put spirit in the French. If they miscarry, we miscarry too. That misbegotten devil Falconbridge, in spite of spite alone, upholds the day. <laughs> they say King John, sore sick, hath left the field. Lead me to the revolts of England here. When we were happy, we had other names. It, it, it is the Count Maloon. Wounded to death. Fly. Noble English, you are bought and sold. Unthread the rude eye of rebellion and welcome home again discarded faith. Seek out King John and fall before his feet. For if the French be lords of this loud day, he means to recompense the pains you take by cutting off your head. Thus has he sworn. And I with him and many more with me upon the altar at St. Edmundsbury, even on that altar where we swore to you dear amity and everlasting love. May this be possible. May this be true. What? in the world should make me now deceive since I must lose the use of all deceit. Why should I then be false since it is true that I must die here and live hands by truth? I say again, if Louis do win the day, he is forsworn. If e'er those eyes of yours behold another daybreak in the east, even this night, your breathing shall expire, paying the fine of rated treachery, even with a treacherous fine of all your lives, if Louis, by your assistance, win the day. Commend me to one Hubert with your king. The love of him and this respect besides for that my grandsire was an Englishman, awakes my conscience to confess all this. In lieu whereof, I pray you bear me hence, from forth the noise and rumour of the field, where I may think the remnant of my thoughts in peace, and part this body and my soul with contemplation and devout desires. Oh, 
Oh, we do believe thee and beshrew my soul, but I do love the favour and the form of this most fair occasion, by the which we will untread the steps of damned flight, and like a baited and retired flood, leaving our rankness and irregular course, stoop low within those bounds we have o'erlooked, and calmly run on in obedience even to our ocean, to our great King John. My arm shall give thee help to bear thee hence, for I do see the cruel pangs of death right in thine eye. Away, my friends, new flight and happy newness that intends old right. Exeunt, leading off Maloon. Act five, scene five, the French camp. Enter Louis the Dauphin. Oh, the sun of heaven we thought was low to set, but stayed and made the western welkin blush when the English measure backward on their ground in faint retire. Oh, 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 bravely came we off when with a volley of our needless shot oh, and after such bloody toil, we bid good night and wound our tottering colors clearly up, last in the field, and almost lords of it. Where is my prince, the Dauphin? Here, what news? The Count Mulan is slain. The English lords, by his persuasion, are again fallen off. And your supply, which you have wished so long, are cast away and sunk on Goodwin sands. Oh, foul shrewd news, beshrew thy very heart. I did not think to be so sad tonight as this has made me. Who was he that said King John did fly an hour or two before? The stumbling knight did part our weary powers. Whoever spoke it, it, it is true, my lord. Well, keep good quarter and good care tonight. The day shall not be up so soon as I to try the fair adventure of tomorrow. Exeunt. Act five, scene six, an open place in the neighborhood of Swinstead Abbey. Enter Bastard and Hubert severally. Who's there? Speak low, speak quickly or I shoot. A friend, what art thou? Of the part of England. Whither that dost thou go? What's that to thee? Why may not I demand of thine affairs as well as thou of mine? Hubert, I think. Hmm. Thou hast a perfect thought. I will upon all hazards well believe thou art my friend that knows my tongue so well. Who art thou? Who thou wilt. <laughs> and if thou please, thou mayest befriend me so much as to think I come one way of the Plantagenets. Unkind remembrance. Thou an endless night have done me shame. Brave soldier, pardon me that any accent breaking from thy tongue should scape the true acquaintance of mine ear. Come, come, sans compliment, and what news abroad? Why, here walk I in the black brow of the night to find you out. Brief, then, and what's the news? Oh, my sweet sir, news fitting to the night, black, fearful, comfortless, and horrible. Show me the very wound of this ill news. I am no woman, I will not swound at it. The king, I fear, is poisoned by a monk. I left him almost speechless and broke out to acquaint you with this evil that you might the better arm you to the sudden time than if you had at leisure known of this. How did he take it? Who, who did taste to him? A monk, I tell you, a resolved villain whose bowels suddenly burst out. The king yet speaks and peradventure may recover. Who didst thou leave to tend his majesty? Why, know you not? The lords are all come back and brought Prince Henry in their company, at whose request the king hath pardoned them, and they are all about his majesty. Withhold thine indignation, mighty heaven, and tempt us not to bear our power. I tell thee, Hubert, half my power this night passing these flats are, are taken by the tide these lincoln washes have devoured them myself well mounted hardly have escaped go away before 
It conduct me to the king. I doubt he will be dead or ere I come. Exeunt, Act 5, Scene 7, The Orchard at Swinstead Abbey. Enter Prince Henry, Salisbury and Bigot. It is too late. The life of all his blood is touched corruptibly, and his pure brain, which some suppose the soul's frail dwelling house, doth by the idle comments that it makes foretell the ending of mortality. His Highness yet doth speak, and holds belief that being brought into the open air it would allay the burning quality of that fell poison which assaileth him. Let him be brought into the Did he still rage? He is more patient than when you left him. Even now, he's sung. Oh, vanity of sickness. Fierce extremes in their continuance will not feel themselves. Death, having preyed upon the outward parts, leaves them invisible, and his siege is now against the mind, the which he pricks and wounds with many legions of strange fantasies, which in their throng and press to that last hold confound themselves. It is strange that death should sing. I am the signet to this pale, faint swan who chants a doleful hymn to his own death, and from the organ pipe of frailty sings his soul and body to their lasting rest. Be of good comfort, Prince, for you are born to set a form upon that indigest which he hath left so shapeless and so rude. Hi, Mary, now my soul hath elbow room, it would not out of windows nor at doors. <laughs> There is so hot a summer in my bosom that all my bowels crumble up to dust. <laughs> I am a scribbled form drawn with a pen upon a parchment and against this fire do I shrink up. How fair your majesty. Oh. Poisoned, ill fair, dead, forsook, cast off, and none of you will bid the winter come and thrust his icy fingers in my maw, nor let my kingdom's river take their course through my burned bosom or entreat the north to make his bleak winds kiss my parched lips and comfort me with cold. <laughs> I do not ask you much. I beg cold comfort and he you are all so straight and so ingrateful, you deny me that. <laughs> oh, that there were virtue in my tears that might relieve you. The salt in them is hot. Within me is a hell, and there the poison is as a fiend, confined to tyrannize on unreprievable, condemned blood. <sighs> I am scalded with my vile emotion and spleen of speed to see your majesty. Oh, cousin. Thou art come to set mine eyes. The tackle of my heart is cracked and broke. And all the shrouds wherein my life should sail are turned to one thread, one little hair. My heart hath one poor string to stay it by, which holds but till thy news be uttered. And then, and then the rest is a clod of unconfounded royalty.
The Dauphin is preparing hitherwards where heaven, he knows how we shall answer him. In a night, the best part of my power as I open advantage did remove, wherein the washes all unwarily devoured by the unexpected flood. You breathe these dead news in a steadened ear. Oh, my liege, my lord, that now a king, now thus. Even so must I run on, and even so stop. What surety of the world, what hope, what stay, when this was now a king, and now is clay. Well, thou gone so. I do but stay behind to do the office for thee of revenge. And then my soul shall wait on thee to heaven, as it on earth hath been thy servant still. And now, now, you stars, the move in your right spheres, where be your powers? Show now your mended face and instantly return with me again to push destruction and perpetual shame out of the weak door of the fainting land. Straight, let us seek. Or straight, we shall be sought. The Dauphin rages at our very heels. It seems you know not then so much as we. The Cardinal Pandolf is within at rest, who half an hour since came from the Dauphin and brings from him such offers of our peace, as we with honour and respect may take with purpose presently to leave this war. He will the rather do it when he sees ourselves well sinewed to our defence. Nay, tis in a manner done already. For many carriages he hath dispatched to the seaside, and put his cause and quarrel to the disposing of the cardinal, with whom yourself, myself, and other lords, if you think meet, this afternoon will post to consummate this business happily. Well, let it be so. And you, my noble prince, with other princes that may best be spared, shall wait upon your father's funeral. At Worcester must his body be interred, for so he willed it. Thither shall it then, and happily may your sweet self put on the lineal state and glory of the land. To whom, with all submission on my knee, I do bequeath my faithful services and true subjection everlastingly. And the like tender of our love we make to rest without a spot for evermore. I have a kind soul that would give thanks and knows not how to do it but with tears. Oh, <laughs> let us pay the time but needful woe, since it hath been beforehand with our griefs. This England never did nor never shall lie at the proud foot of a conqueror, but when it did first help to wound itself. Now, these her princes are come home again. Come the three corners of the world in arms, and we shall shock them. Nought shall make us rue if England to itself do rest but true. Exeunt. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get you all back on stage now to take your bow and give yourselves a massive round of applause for a sensational treatment of the life and death of King John. Incredible work, everyone. I am in awe of all of you. That was absolutely tremendous. Really, really one of my favorite ones to watch so far, I have to say. Absolutely joyful. Thank you all so much so much. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I shall now introduce to you, as is our want, our cast and crew, starting off as always with our incredible producer, Sarah Peachy. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah, I'm an actor and project manager based in Glasgow. Our associate director, stage manager and master of props, Emily Ingram. Hi, I'm Emily, I'm a director, writer and stage manager based in Edinburgh. On music and sound, it's Adam Woodhams. Hi, I'm Adam Williams, a sound designer based in the southwest of England. And for uh, Movement and Fights, Enrique Ortuño. 
Hi everyone, my name is Andrew Mafai, I'm movement director based. <laughs> I didn't quite get that, but he's a movement and fight director based in London. <laughs> Our cast uh, for my, tonight. With, with, with very with very bad internet, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Our <ca> <laughs> Excuse me. Our cast put together by Sydney Aldridge uh, put on an amazing show for you tonight, and here they are as Philip the Bastard, Charlie Clee. <laughs> uh, I'm an actor and I'm in London. As King John, Hannah Young. Hello, I'm Hannah Young and I'm an actor and I live in Stratford-upon-Avon. As Constance, Julia Jolzetti. Hi, I'm Julia Jolzetti. I am an actor, teaching artist and mom in San Diego, California. As Philip, King of France, Stephen Jensen. Hi, I'm Stephen Jensen. I'm an actor and retired teacher in El Cajon, California. As Hubert de Burr, Kareem Hadaya. Hi guys, I live in London and I'm an actor. Yay. <laughs> Yay. As Cardinal Pandolf, Austin Titchener. Hi, I'm Austin Titchener. I'm an actor, a playwright, and co-artistic director of the Reduced Shakespeare Company, and I'm based in Chicago. As Salisbury, Francesca Baker. Hi, I'm Francesca, and I live in Dorset. As Louis the Dauphin, Jamie Grisham. Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm, I'm an actor and director choreographer, and I'm in Mississippi in the US. As Arthur, Neve James. Hi, I'm an actor and I'm in London, UK. As Pembroke, PJ Barner. Hi, I'm PJ and I'm from, I'm an actor, director and missionary from Davao City, Philippines. As Queen Eleanor, Danielle Farrow. Hi, I'm an actor in Edinburgh, UK. As Blanche of Spain and Prince Henry, Isabel Adamarco Young. Hi, I'm Isabel Adamarco Young. I'm an actor, writer and drag king based in London. Amazing. Oh, wow. I want to ask you about that. Chatillon and Lord Bigot, Hasna Haider. Hi, I'm Hasna Haider. I'm a writer based in London. As Limoges, Duke of Austria, Vera Suomi. Hi, I'm Vera Suomi. I'm a Finnish actor based in London. And our ensemble for this evening, starting first of all with Ian Blackwell Rogers. Hi, I'm Ian. I am in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland, between Washington and DC. I'm an actor. Amazing. And Lauren Wilson. Hello, I'm Lauren. Uh, I'm a Kiwi actor, light and sound designer, and I'm based in London. Adam Pelter Pauls. Hi, I'm Adam Pelter Pauls. I'm uh, an actor uh, living in Brooklyn, New York. And our swings for this evening, also taking on some additional roles, uh, Susan Benninghoff. Hi, I'm Susan Benninghoff. I'm an actor in San Diego, California. And Drew Linson. Hi, I'm Drew Linson. And despite my advancing years, I'm actually a recently trained actor and I live in Croatia. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Our swings, of course, would have valiantly swung into action to keep the story moving forward. But fortunately, it seemed like we didn't need that this evening. But I'm so pleased that you got to see them anywhere. Anyway, giving it the beans in their various roles. So thank you all so much. Uh, for your participation this evening. That was genuinely uh, an incredible performance. Thank you all so much. Uh, what a joy, what a joy. So, uh, Sarah, do we have any questions from our audience? Uh, yes, we've got a couple started coming in. Still lots of applause <laughs> and flowers of flooding through, <laughs> which is wonderful. Um, so, uh, I've got, let me see. So I've got While you look, I'll, I, I can, oh, you've got one? Okay, go on. I, I do, I do, yes. Uh, so. Um, I've got a question here, which is people with experience with the histories, did King John feel different? I'll open that one out to the floor. Uh, shall I, um, yes. I might say something? I suppose, yeah, go for it, Hannah. I suppose in some ways he's he's quite flawed, isn't he? He's not like a valiant king. He's not like Henry V, like all gung-ho. He sort of starts with everything to lose. And he's very impetuous. Um, so, you know, he, he, he doesn't seem very regal in many ways. And that's sort of something that we kind of played with, particularly on that first scene of him being a little bit like, um, oh, a bit sort of, sort of throwing it here and there with his power. Like he, he suddenly, he's, he's very imp impetuous. He suddenly decides to do something on a whim. 
So it does feel quite different in that in that respect. I don't know if anybody else wants to say anything about their experiences of being in in history plays, but I feel like that for me seemed like the the, the biggest thing in terms of playing that role. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Uh, Austin, you uh, you were chip again. No, no. All, all I was saying that yes, it is different. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but what Hannah said was lovely, and I loved uh, Gemma's introduction as well. Yes, I thought Gemma gave a great introduction to it. Some of the, the key ways in which it's different. Uh, to me, it feels like a, a, a history play that is uniquely concerned with its present. There's far less uh, discussion of uh, kind of lineage and, and t uh, time and the future time and what's going to come and all that kind of thing. It's Everything's very immediate. Uh, and the, the kind of blinkers are on in this play. Every, everyone is just uh, kind of buffeted from one event to the next uh, without really necessarily knowing what's going to happen or, or even planning for what's going to happen and often the plans that they do make are frustrated in various ways so um, to me compared to the uh, the histories that we've done so far you know we had the Henry VI one two and three and Richard II Richard III uh, especially it feels almost like an opposite uh, to Richard III in many ways uh, yeah yeah I thought it was a fascinating distinction anyone kind of else done done a lot of histories kind of moral ambiguity in this one you you don't know who the good guys are from moment to moment <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it was described uh, in some of the dramaturgy that I was reading in preparation for doing this about a, a, a noose to catch the actors in, in terms of, uh, sorry, not the actors, sorry, the audience in, in terms of who they were supposed to relate to. So a great example of that, I think, is when uh, Arthur falls from the walls and dies. Uh, we as an audience have been 100% uh, on Arthur's side for that whole thing. Salisbury and Pembroke discover them and we're, we're so moved by their reactions to that and as a consequence of that they defect to the French and join Louis the Dauphin and we're like yeah <laughs> and it's like the whole uh, narrative devices that Shakespeare deploys in this play to me feel deliberately placed to uh, frustrate an audience and to not give them easy answers and to, and to give the impression of a, a deeply complex world and I think that's p possibly because the, of the, the earliness of this play relative to the other history plays. If you think about France and England, England almost branching off from France, um, we, we're right at the start of that split here where France and England are much more intertwined and in, intermingled and especially the ruling class uh, of England are, are much more French at this time. Uh, and so I think it, it, if, if it isn't a result of that, then he picked the perfect time period for this theatrical experiment because uh, that kind of proximity to one another really helps it read. Ian, sorry. Oh yeah, I I I feel like as a as a as an ensemble, it's having having worked on other histories where I think as we've all been saying that the 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 the, the more the histories people have seen are much more neatly tied up in a bow as far as plot. Oh, this was always going to be the the way things went and you know who to root for and you this one isn't so as an ensemble if you're doing you know i don't henry five you have to decide are we going to go straight on with the patriotism that is that is built in here or are we going to fight it as a production with this one you just have to strap into the roller coaster kind of you don't have to decide are we with or against the propaganda because it's like you say all over the place Absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Sarah, any more questions? Uh, yes, we've got a few in now. So um, I've got one here for Julia. Um, someone has asked, how did you decide how to portray your character? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know how to answer that without turning it into a big Rob love fest. Um, I had- Then go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I was really excited when I, I was like a lot of people not familiar with King John at the beginning of this. So when I was going through the descriptions of the characters, um, being here in America, um, we're having a bit of a time right now with people in authority. So I immediately, you know, wanted to play Constance because I felt it was a good outlet for some some rage issues I'm currently dealing with. Um, so I think I just kind of latched onto it from that. Um, I read some um, descriptions of Constance that uh, referred to her as a combination or an extension of Juliet if she had survived. 
and ended up having children that she would fiercely defend her kids in the same way and would have the same sort of um, lofty language and uh, also Hermione if she had been a bit more fed up or maybe not been on trial in public when all these things were happening. So um, I, I mean, knowing the way Shakespeare plagiarizes himself, I kind of took Shakespeare characters I knew um, and loved so well and kind of put them into Constance. And it, it felt, it felt uh, correct in that way uh, when I was doing it. It was like, oh, this is all lining up with stuff that I know. <laughs> so yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Sarah, any more questions? Yes, so uh, I have got one here um, uh, that says, again, that you're using camera angles more and more. Um, is that on Rob's direction, where to point, or do the actors uh, get a say in how to portray different um, asides or addressings to each other? Uh, it's a combination. So essentially, we are establishing uh, via R&Ds with uh, myself and Enrique in particular, uh, we are always looking at ways that we can use the visual storytelling of this medium that uh, feels so unique and fresh. Uh, and that does evolve every week. Um, we uh, have been looking at how we can uh, create some, I guess, standard grammar for how camera moves work in this medium uh, and, and how they portray certain things. However, that is always going to be limited by uh, the amount of time that we have, which on these productions is very short, uh, and also by uh, the circumstances that we encounter play to play. Uh, and so, for instance, um, we were inspired on this production by the description of Arthur's grave as being three foot, that Arthur actually needs to feel really small. Uh, and that's something that we need to signal to the audience. And so we ended up with these kind of high angle asides where we're, where we're looking down, steeply down at Arthur uh, to try and uh, sell to the audience that psychological trick uh, that Arthur is, is considerably smaller than the rest of the characters. At the same time, we absolutely throw it open to the actors and say, while you're looking at the text, if you find a moment that you think a camera move will serve with this kind of basic knowledge of the functions that we've explored so far, um, bring it to the table. We want to see it and we want to workshop it. Uh, and that happened at several points during this production. So it was, it was, it's always, as always with this, um, it's a collaboration. You know, we, we are firm believers in the wisdom of crowds. And uh, that has been proven once again for me. Absolutely. Cool, I have another question here, which is for everyone, so all the cast. Um, what previous knowledge did you have of the play before this week and what challenges or pleasures did you find in grappling with this rarely seen work? Um, I can just jump in with a bit of a joke that the only thing I knew about King John before this was from Austin's uh, performance of the complete works of William Shakespeare Bridge, where he's there for two seconds. <laughs> that's, that's it. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, I, honestly, that's about how much I knew as well, is, have, is saying, uh, doing that bit in the play. Um, I, it's funny, I've, I have a love-hate relationship with this play because it's not the play I want it to be. Um, I want it to mention Robin Hood and the Magna Carta and do all these wonderful things, and it doesn't do that. But what it does do is pretty fabulous. And, uh, and so I'm really thrilled to have been a part of this thing because now I feel like I really un understand and appreciate the play so much more. Um, Lovely I came, stuff. The, I'm pretty much the same as I came off just doing in New Zealand, uh, The Lion in Winter, where I was Alice. Uh, uh, and we kind of vaguely covered that Shakespeare had written something, but we of course then went off Robin Hood and the Magna Carta. And of course, John is like 16 in that show. And we played him as an uh, annoying, bratty 16 year old. So it's, 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 it's interesting to see kind of how Shakespeare portrayed it to something written back in the, I think it was the 50s it was written. Yeah. I mean, I came across it uh, during the uh, performance of the Globe um, and they were doing it up in Northampton and then they took it down to the Globe. And I was hooked by the, by the bastard. Um, and and I've and I did uh, his first monologue for for auditioning, um, and and I was just hooked with the character really. But this is the first time I've really that I've ever performed it or, or gotten into the play itself. So yeah, it's been nice. I uh, saw an RSC production with a friend who was playing both the bastard and Hubert which was a really interesting conflation. 
but I'm so glad we had the, the two separate tonight. <laughs> and I've known the play because I think Constance is amazing, but I've actually realized she's even more amazing watching tonight. That was just brilliant. Wonderful. I would recommend, though, that you check out Danielle Farrow's Twitter for uh, a film project that she did where she played uh, Constance in a monologue. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful treatment of the text. Uh, I highly recommend checking it out. It's really, really great. Thank really you. Really lovely stuff. Not at all. No, seriously. It's, it's awesome. It's really awesome. Uh, any, anyone else uh, on your prior knowledge or not of King John? Anyone, anyone any overriding impressions? I've liked this play for decades, actually, but I've only, in all that time, I've only seen maybe two performances of the whole show. So it's it's very rarely done, and and uh, it's it's good that you're putting it out there and letting people see it. You know, it's been a it's been a, a real surprise and a real joy actually on this one. Uh, I think somebody asked how how long we have to prepare it, and the answer is about two and a half days before we get the actors in. Uh, so tomorrow morning, I will uh, be starting to read uh, and edit Merchant of Venice, uh, and then we kind of do an R and D with the whole team. Uh, where we get together and we uh, look at what opportunities there are to exploit and how we might want to go out, go about exploiting them. I then go into uh, JSTOR, which the academics will probably be uh, pretty familiar with, and just deep dive, just nose dive into as much different varied opinion as I can find about it. Uh, and then from that kind of uh, just f follow my nose and follow my instincts and, and, and use what I find useful and that resonates with me and uh, jump what doesn't. Because uh, unfortunately there is some rubbish out there as well. <laughs> but that's, that's the job of the director, right? Is to, is to figure out what, what are the things that matter uh, in a given production. Uh, and so all of that happens up until about Sunday afternoon, by which point Sunday evening we get into the first rehearsal and then we do the whole thing again. Uh, so yeah, a bit, bit of a bit of a washing machine at times, just zipping around in circles, but it's, uh, but it's always wonderful because every week you've got a new piece of Shakespeare to discover and you know, what could be better than that really? Sarah, any more questions? Uh, yes, so just off the back of that one, we did have a question for Austin, uh, which was, can you share with us how the Reduced Shakespeare Company dealt with King John in your original production? <laughs> uh, uh, yes, which uh, that original, the first production of the Reduced Shakespeare Company was written by uh, Daniel Singer, Adam Long and Jess Winfield, and not me, um, but I'm in the video. So it's the moment where it's the, mo it, to test, um, to test the knowledge of the audience, uh, of the, I raised my, I asked everybody who's read King John, because that, because nobody's read King John. And of course, some people in the audience have read King John, which terrifies me and I run off stage and they will think, well, we can't possibly do this because- I was one more. of those people when you were in Edinburgh once. Uh, I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good bit, it's a good bit, but now with the, uh, that now with the sort of rising popularity of King John in the last, whatever, couple of decades, I'm not sure the bit works anymore. Oh yeah, everybody's read King John, hmm, here we go. And now they will have watched this. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry to have ruined a bit for you, mate. That was, that was our There's, intention coming in. <laughs> it's like buses. There's just another bit coming along in a couple of minutes. Not a problem. Absolutely, absolutely. Wonderful. Amazing, uh, cool. So I've got, um... Uh, a question uh, for us, actually, so, uh, uh, me and Rob. Um, so we, uh, someone asked, have you considered performing edited versions of 60 or 90 minutes to engage younger or non-traditional audiences in Shakespeare? Uh, short answer, yes. Uh, I don't think we'll necessarily do like distinct ones. What I think we'll probably do is take all our archival material once we've completed the complete works and we will cut it to uh, 30 and 60 minute versions. Uh, which will uh, obviously be useful uh, in all kinds of ways for all kinds of audiences. So yes, thank you so much for uh, asking. Uh, it is definitely something we've considered. Um, however, we might need to wait until we've, <laughs> until we're not doing a show every week <laughs> to uh, to put them together. But yes, it's definitely on the list. It's definitely on the to-do mm. list. And I was going to say, I think in terms of the way that we do edit the shows at the moment, um, I think what's really nice about the opportunity while we are in lockdown and while people don't have to worry about traveling to theatres, um, you know, having, you know, getting home in the evening with long shows. It, it's an opportunity to see the plays, you know, almost in their full length um, and discover some of those parts that often do get chopped out um, 
when trying to make it a more manageable performance length. So yeah, we, we try to get our shows down to about two and a half hours um, so that you're not sitting at your screens uh, going blurry eyes <laughs> for too long. Um, but at the same time, trying to, to um, maintain all of the, the elements. We don't cut any whole scenes. We don't cut entire speeches. Um, uh, unless they really deviate and, and you know there's a particular reason but otherwise it's it's just um just trimming it down a little bit to make it a slightly more manageable length absolutely absolutely i saw a number of people in the chat as well talking about speeches in this that rarely get performed even when even when the show is produced uh, and actually how uh, great those speeches were one in particular was the uh, the louis the dauphin speech once pandolf comes in and tells him he can't go to war uh, and uh, yeah, so, so, so many people just discovering these kind of golden nuggets that so often get overlooked is wonderful, really wonderful. Any more questions? Uh, yes, I've got a couple more. Um, so uh, yeah, so I've, I've got one actually, um, again, which is one for you to pick up on, Rob, but um, um, actually, uh, yeah, that was about casting. So um, how basically how does the casting process work because obviously we don't have an audition process um and they said the casting's been so good so what is it you kind of look for in actors um during the casting process and obviously our lovely casting director sydney isn't with us at the moment but um but i think you can speak to that process yes yes i was i was just gonna immediately just <laughs> kind of throw it at the feet of uh, sydney and just say that uh, you know sydney aldridge our casting director is absolutely terrific at what she does um she is very thorough in the exploration of all of the applicants uh, that we get um we ask each of our applicants uh, every uh, when they first sign up kind of what their experience with shakespeare is and we always try to be mindful of getting a balance of people with different levels of experience with shakespeare so obviously you'll have people in this cast tonight uh, that have been doing Shakespeare for many many years uh, and have done many many productions equally you'll get some people that have only maybe done one or two and that is deliberate as well because we believe and also people that aren't actors primarily because we believe that Shakespeare is for everyone uh, and the best way to prove that is to get everyone doing it uh, so you know we try and make sure that we get that range of experience in there uh, obviously we try and make sure that our uh, representation of typically underrepresented groups in theatre across all variables uh, are represented to the extent that we can from the applications that we receive that's another uh, kind of key aspect of it um, but yes we don't we don't audition we ask people on the form if there is any specific context that they want to share with us that they believe makes them suitable for a particular role uh, and we do try and take all of that into account but equally uh, Sydney will often see something in someone uh, and think actually this person I think in this role uh, could be really interesting and so uh, Sydney and I uh, make sure that we have very active conversations usually on a Friday uh, going back and forth over uh, over the casting and it's always uh, a little bit of a Rubik's Cube because you've got to make sure obviously that the relationships and interrelationships of characters all read for the audience as well so it's an incredibly complex puzzle that uh, Sydney has to solve every week uh, and do so from people that a majority a majority of which she's never met or worked with before either and I think that's something maybe that um you know this is a bit of insider goss I guess but uh, casting directors obviously meet an incredible volume of actors over their careers and they they know uh, the actors that they uh, kind of believe in uh, and uh, can put forward with confidence and all that kind of thing um and with this one uh, Sydney is doing an incredible job of staying open and, st and and being willing to give new faces uh, chances week after week after week. You know, in, in all of our shows, apart from obviously the alumni shows, where it's people that uh, have worked on a, on a previous TSMGO show, uh, about 90% of uh, the cast are new uh, week in and week out. So um, that's something that we're really proud of. Uh, and it's something that I just want to give Sydney full, full props for um, because she, she bravely dives in to the unknowns every week and I think that is something that maybe and again I don't you know I don't know a lot of casting directors <laughs> not fortunate enough to be that well connected but uh, it's something that from from what I see in the in the business if you like uh, it's something that that seems to me unique that that willingness to constantly be discovering new talent and I think uh, our audience can respect that every week that does happen and it just goes to show 
actually how many extraordinarily talented actors are out there that can that can do this to an astonishing standard frankly especially when you think about the time constraints and the technological constraints that are placed on top of it the fact that so many actors come uh, onto these shows week in and week out and give stunning moving uh, powerful performances to me is, is just a testament to how phenomenal actors as a as a species are <laughs> and how uh, and how incredible the the depth of talent is that that you can keep keep new faces coming through and they can all deliver at that standard uh, i think it's i think it's it's something that never ceases to amaze me absolutely um, well, I've got one more question, um, which was actually came through for Gemma, who um, unfortunately wasn't able to join us for the Q&A today. Uh, but I'm going to throw it out to everyone because I'd love to get sort of everyone's um, thoughts um, uh, on this. Um, but the question was, uh, what do you think inspired Shakespeare to dramatise King John's story? Because he knew it would be a big money maker. Everybody loves shows about King John. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea. <laughs> um, I don't have a. I don't have a, like a formed response to that. But uh, I'll, I'll take it from my character's perspective that um, I think this was an opportunity to show um, the effects of choices made by people in power by those who aren't those people. Basically the, 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 the people who have to be stepped on in order for the end result to be displayed for our history books. It's like Shakespeare's taking this history that we know about King John and going, okay, so here's what you know. Here's all the stuff that was going on behind the scenes. That's actually more interesting than what you know. So that's why, I, I mean, I just immediately connected to that and was like, oh, let's do the behind the scenes of the history book. Yeah, I completely agree with that statement because like, as Rob has said, like, uh, you've got the bastard as kind of like your main voice of reason. And he legit goes to the two kings, boy, listen to me. This is what we're going to do. And even like with First Citizen, like you've got this amazing speech where it's like, you you guys don't have to fight, just get them married and peace and love. So I'm just like, compared to like every other history. So maybe Shakespeare was just like, you know what? I'm just going to write about the basic people who just don't, want to deal with the king and his attitude <laughs> i actually do have another thought that is that is slightly more serious and less comic which is that you know according to various things about who when this play was written 1596 ish uh he he wrote the first and second parts of henry the sixth or what became the first and second parts of henry the sixth quite around this time and it's so it's the late 16th century and he's writing all these plays about governments and chaos about um, um, a chronology and, and, and anarchy when a clear successor is not clear. Uh, and, uh, and he was living in that time. Elizabeth didn't have an heir and she was unmarried. And the, the succession was a very much a question. And I think, I think a little bit that he was writing these plays as a kind of a, as cautionary tales a little bit, suggesting that we don't want this again in our time, I think. Absolutely, yeah. 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 Sorry, go on, Daniel. Um, no, that was was my thought, first thought as well when you heard the question was just just how relevant it is to today because it's about who can you trust and everybody's going to spin things in this way and that and uh, there'll be moments you believe anybody and then suddenly you're like, how could I have believed that? Um, and I think that a lot of people are feeling that way now. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it was an astonishing, it was a bracingly relevant play, I have to say, when I was discovering it for the first time, uh, ju just kind of tripping over these lines where I'm just like, oh my God, that is, that's so right. <laughs> you know, that's so, so, it feels incredibly raw uh, at a time like this. And I think that's actually because it's a, it's an almost uniquely self-interested play in terms of every single character is in it expressly for themselves at anyone else's expense. Uh, and this play, I think, is a kind of a cautionary tale about a society that, that cannibalizes itself through through extreme selfishness. Uh, and that, that was really what I what I took from it as a as a work. Yeah. 
Um, bit, bit of trivia if you want it. The reason Robin Hood's not in it is because that would have automatically made King John the villain. And in the opening uh, in King Two, uh, in King Two, Act Two, Scene One, King John uh, stuffs the cardinal under a bus and says, "No Italian priest is going to come and tithe our dominions." And it's all pomp uh, set up to uh, be essentially anti-Catholic. And there's an, an incredible amount of anti-Catholic sentiment around at the time that Shakespeare was writing. Uh, this was around the time, uh, kind of in the lead up to the gunpowder plot. Uh, and so if you put Robin Hood in it, you get John as a villain. And again, in this piece, what's unique and wonderful, I think, about it is that there are no villains. There are all there are a large collection of individually flawed people uh, who are in it for themselves. And John is just another one. And yeah. Sorry, go on, Hannah. That's what I was going to say. It really does feel like there are no heroes in this piece either. All villains, you know, like, as you said, everybody, everybody's got their agenda. Everybody has. Even Constance got her agenda. You know, she's grieving her child before her child is dead because it's political for her. She has, she she needs her child to be the successor. Whether or not she actually, even that awful thing where they're all talking at this child, they're all, they're all, it's like he's a little pawn and we're all just moving him around. You know, it's quite, it's extraordinary really. And, and we did talk, I, I really enjoyed that we didn't have that much time to talk about these things because as Robert said, we had three days, but this thing on its feet, it's, it's very exciting. But we did talk about how, you know, immediately what does it feel about nowadays and we did say you know like John and Philip they're the kind of people who would tweet they're leaders that would tweet things like it's all about it's all about oh um if I do this will they like me you know how many hits am I gonna how many likes am I gonna get if I do this thing or maybe this thing and it's very impetuous um and I don't know it's just quite a fascinating pay for that um and your game was brilliant at the beginning it's twists and turns it's all about that isn't it you know how many times of this change, play change direction. Yeah, it's extraordinary, really extraordinary. So uh, I'd like to just finish on, on one final question, which has been a, a, a kind of keen topic of debate among our uh, audience this evening, uh, which is uh, for Ian Blackwell Rogers, uh, are you in fact actually Shakespeare? And if not, uh, why not? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> If uh, you know if anybody is out there writing um, writing pieces and and needs somebody cast, I am I am available to be considered. I <laughs> I would not say no. Right answer, right answer. And uh, the other the other popular choice from our audience was Inigo Montoya. So you've you've got an incredible uh, combination casting there, mate. That's uh, I'll, I'll pretty good that. for an evening's work. I see I see Poe in our comments, not the not the public ones. I see Edgar Allan Poe, and I have in fact done Poe. Oh, nice. A couple of times in, in DC, Baltimore. So Poe, I've been there, but Shakespeare, I will, I will happily take on, but I'm not a writer. <laughs> I, I, want, I want somebody else to write it. Amazing, amazing, fabulous. Well, I, I hope that does work out. Sorry, go on, Austin. We'll talk. <laughs> there we go, there we go, it's happening. The magic is happening right in front of your eyes, ladies and gentlemen. And with that, uh, on that bombshell, we will call it a night for this evening. Thank you so much, everybody, that stuck with us to the bit around. We really appreciate it. Please do like the video, subscribe to the channel. And if you can, please consider making a donation to our Patreon fund. Thank you all so much. We will see you next week for an alumni production of The Merchant of Venice. Thank you so much, everybody, and good night.